It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, facing charges. Former President Trump heading to New York ahead of tomorrow's court appearance. Coming up, a look at the timing, the possible charges, and what's next. Then, in bloom, the family, one of the University of Idaho murder victims, now speaking out. We say in our family, if we touch as many lives as he did in his 20 years, this world would be a better place. He was an amazing kid. How their community is honoring Ethan Chapin's legacy with a very touching tribute. Plus, Justine Bateman live. The 80s sitcom icon turned writer, director, and author, now making headlines for opening up about Hollywood and aging gracefully. My face represents who I am. Uh, I like it. She's here talking to us about those comments and how they're striking a chord with women everywhere. And a little bit country. We go inside last night's CMT Awards for a look at the most memorable moments. Today, Monday, April 3rd, 2023. Happy Monday from Ashley, Kentucky, Wayne, North Dakota, Eddieville, South Carolina, Knoxville, North Carolina, and Corpus Christi, Texas. Here to celebrate the twins' 17th birthday from Raleigh, North Carolina. Wishing my mom a happy 74th birthday. I love you. Kindergartners at our Cole Elementary. And Silver Spring, Maryland. Miss Boatman loves you. From Waterloo, Iowa. For my sweet 16. Cheering on San Diego State. Go, Go Aztecs. Travel more than 2,700 miles. From Ketchikan, Alaska. To the Today Show. We are back with a Today exclusive and a powerful new conversation about women and aging, and it's ignited by Justine Bateman. She, of course, shot to fame in the 1980s, playing Mallory Keaton in the beloved sitcom Family Ties, has gone into a successful career as a writer, director, and author. But it is a recent interview that has the 57-year-old in the spotlight firing back in an online discussion about her looks. Take a peek. Well, when you say, is there beauty in aging, aren't you really saying... Do you think it's possible for other people to find aging beautiful? And like, I just don't give a Like, I think I look rad. I think my face represents who I am. Uh, I like it. And so that's basically the end of the road. There you go. <laughs> Okay, you hit a nerve, like, girl. Yes. You hit a nerve. You have a lot of women saying amen. I mean, to me, it, it seems like confidence. Like when you said I look rad, you're like, I love me. I love every part of me. I love the way I'm aging and changing. Is, is it really about confidence? Well, I think it's really about fear. Because mm -hmm. I think that everybody has a completion to this sentence. I'm afraid if people think I look old, then therefore... And for different people, it's different things. Some are afraid they'll lose their job or never get a job or not get a maid or no one's going to listen to them or whatever. And that fear, my position is that that fear existed before your face started changing. Mm. So it's an opportunity to take care of that fear so it's not leading you around by the nose and making you make other, de making you make other decisions that are not mm -hmm. you, taking mm -hmm. you off track. You've been an activist on this for a while. You wrote a whole book I'm about it. I'm not an activist. Yes, you are, whether you want no, it or I'm not. I'm not an activist. <laughs> what are you? I'm just somebody who got, got myself on the other side of that, what that fear was for me in particular. Uh -huh. And I just am sharing what worked uh -huh. for me. There's uh -huh. lots of ways to get there. Uh -huh. But for anyone who wants to get yeah. free... That's yeah. what I well. That's what I wanted to ask you about because it it was a journey for you too. Yeah. You were start. You said um, it started with a Google search. Can yeah. you tell everybody about that? Well, when I was writing my first book, Fame, uh, mm -hmm. the hijacking of reality, um, uh, yeah, I had to find some incident that had happened with me, and so I did this search and. Um, and then, uh, and in that book, there's a chapter called Acid, if people want to see what, what came mm -hmm. up for me, what that process was. But anyway, once I got to the other side of it, I thought, well, what is it in society as a whole? What are those fears? How did people even get these ideas that a woman's face is broken and has to be fixed? Mm -hmm. And so the book Face is about 47 short stories about um, kind of some of the roots of uh, those beliefs. It, it resonated with me because, I, I mean, I, I remember reading a comment once on, on social media, and it's like, 
what happened to you? And I wrote back, I aged. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what happened to yeah, me. Yeah, life happened. I aged. How do you not like? But what does that even mean? Yeah. It just what happened mean, to I you? know. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a more successful <laughs> and experienced, uh, you know, host of a national it's television like, show. That's what happened to me. Like, what is it? Time you marched on. Doing? Yeah. Like, what have you been doing? Like, what is that even supposed to mean? I it think it's nothing to I, me. It's ridiculous. I do agree. It's but silly. even as. And also, it's that person is telling you what they think of themselves. Yeah. Mm. Yes. When they look in the mirror, that's what they say to themselves. So they're telling you about themselves. They're not telling you about you. Uh huh. I think that's I think that's interesting. So um, how even though we know these things and we think they're silly and ridiculous and they are talking about themselves, etc. Sometimes it is still hard to protect your heart from things like that, even if it comes from a meanie or from somebody else. How do you do that? That's what I'm saying. You've got to get to the fear. Yeah. So, for example, not to put you on the spot, yeah. but when they said, you know, what happened to you? Mm -hmm. It's like when I had that when I had that same situation. Right. Yeah. They sort of horrible things. In fact, there's a anyway, I won't get into it. But um, <laughs> what is it? I what did. A, I did. A, uh, the fears that come up. So. You, yeah. So whatever fears come up, like if somebody says, oh, you wow, you've really aged yeah. for the person who's being told that if they go like, OK, I'm afraid, then therefore X is going to happen. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my mate. Yeah. I'm going to lose now, my whatever. Now, what if they journaled or spoke to yeah. their therapist or their best friend or whatever about that particular fear? Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't have anything to do. The opportunities in your life are still going to come yeah. to you regardless of your gender, your height, your skin color, the state of the age of your yeah. skin. None, your life doesn't care about any of that. Yeah. You're going to keep the only person who's going to X you out of those opportunities is you. Right. Because you're going to say, oh, I can't. I'm too old or no, I don't look right. Blah, blah, yeah. Blah. yeah. None of that no. is that's not how life works. Well, you know what? I keep looking at kids who are young in their 20s and they're all trying to change what is already youthful and beautiful anyway. How do you speak to that? group of people who are somehow trying to change? I think they're trying to avoid, I don't even think they're trying to avoid looking older. I think they're trying to avoid feeling like how these older people are, are representing their feelings. They see all these older people going, uh, oh, I've got to change this. I've got to change that. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. And I think the younger women are going, I don't want to feel like that. Yeah. I don't want to feel terrified that my face is getting older. Yeah. And when I was growing up, I'm, I'm looking at people like, like Anna Mignani and Isabella Hubert and mm -hmm. all this. And, and I was like, I can't wait. You know, I was younger mm -hmm. than them, right? I mean, still, like, yeah. Isabella Hubert <laughs> is like, is, I think it's awesome. <laughs> but I was like, I can't wait to look like that. You felt like that. I couldn't, I couldn't wait to look like how I, I, I couldn't wait to be somewhat similar to, the, to what I was getting from them. Mm. You know, they were just rad, right? Cool. So, yeah, so now I'm like, anyway, it's an inside job. And for, I would say to any young woman, like, you're being lied to. Mm -hmm. Who's making money off of this? Mm -hmm. You're being lied to. Mm -hmm. And you're being tricked off your path. Mm -hmm. Your path is, you got some awesome things coming your way. Mm -hmm. And just stay on your path mm -hmm. and just write out whatever fears come up in you about you know, oh, I'm afraid if people think I look old, then therefore, what's that fill in the blank? Write about that. Deal with that. This isn't this isn't the that. thing. Yeah. And just lastly, you said on 60, you, you were on 60 Minutes Australia and you got a DM from some. Yes, I got quick. a DM. And so some from this woman, uh, uh, Australian woman, I, I assume, who said, I never realized what an impact this conversation was having on younger women. She said until my daughter came in from the other room and said, Hey, did you guys see this? Uh, her 16 year old daughter, did I say that? Mm -hmm. Hey, did you guys see the 60 Minutes thing with Justine Bateman? She said it was great. Now I'm not afraid of getting old. Oh. And I was like, oh my God. If it's just one, if it's one, one. It's just yes. one person, oh, need... like, is not a. It's, it's yeah. silly. I've never been smarter. I've <laughs> never had more connections. You know, it's like when you're younger, you know yeah. the doorman of the nightclub. Yeah. Yeah. When you're older, you know the person who owns the building that yes. the nightclub is in. Yes. You know what I mean? We like, think everything great. great happens yeah. after you're 50. We do. <laughs> great. Justine, thank you. Thank you really so cool. much.
Sunday. We got a bumping, bumping crowd out today. So happy to see everybody. And this morning, y'all, Greece is the word the around world. here. Yay! Oh my gosh, I love it. You guys, we got the whole plaza decked out yep. in pink. We yep. got our pink, turn it around. Yep. We got the pink ladies' jackets yep. on. We got the T bird. We got some T birds come in on, the house. T -bird. We are yeah. celebrating this upcoming prequel, Rise of the Pink mm -hmm. Ladies. We'll do it with the stars of the show. So happy to have them with us in just a few. We'll join them at the diner. Oh, T birds. Yeah. T birds. Uh -huh. T -birds. <laughs> Also, I had a remarkable story highlighting the power of our Start Today Walking Club with a woman who reached her breaking point, decided to join, and has been stepping into her success ever since then. She's here to share that story and, of course, encourage the rest of us to get up and just start walking. Mm. And that. then uh, after that, just a few minutes in the third hour, we're going to spruce up your home, help you celebrate spring with some easy and really affordable crafts as well. For example, have an extra umbrella. Why not turn that umbrella into a wreath? You're going to show you <laughs> Thoughts I never, never had. I never, I never even imagined that. Again. Yeah, but this time we're seniors. And we're gonna rule the school. <laughs> okay, girls. Let's go get them. I so wanted to be a pink lady. We, of course, first met them in the 1972 musical Grease, but how did that girl gang come to be? Well, the world is about to find out in the new prequel series, Grease, Rise of the Pink Ladies. And joining us now are the pinks, Marissa Davila, Cheyenne Isabel Wells, Ari Notar Tommaso, and Trisha Fukuhara. We have a lot to check out. How did I do on those names? Perfect. Okay. okay, all right. First, let's do an exclusive debut of an original song from the series. Take a look. Okay, Pink Ladies, good morning. good morning. I mean, this is just the beginning. There's This is a musical number. I mean, we're going to have lots of new songs and singing. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. 30 original songs. It's incredible. So, I mean, if people are wondering, you know, is it an homage to Greece? Are there, does it, what is its relationship with the movies that we all love? You would say what? It's a love letter yeah. to the original films. I mean, our creator says it best. Those films are the mothership of our series, and, and we take inspiration from them, but we're really doing our own thing. Thing here. So, uh, Ari, what is the story that, that the Pink Ladies are telling now? What are we going to learn about them? Yeah, so so our Greece is set four years before the original movie, um, and we we our origin story is that these Pink Ladies all don't fit in uh, with Rydell or with the, with the greater uh, California at the time. Um, 
Uh, and we all find each other for the things that set us apart, and we all find a way to love each other and accept each other um, while it's hard to be a young person in, in, in high school at the time. Yes. <laughs> Trisha, tell me about all of you. I mean, you, this is like your, your theater kids. You were theater kids. You have a lot of experience, but this is like, this is it. This is your first big break. What did you feel like when you found out I got the pink ladies. Oh, it was wild. I mean, <laughs> to be honest, I thought it was another test. We had, because I yeah. thought it was another audition. Oh, yeah, they tricked you. Tell they us that story. Okay, so I think, for me at least, they told us that it was another audition, and I was actually at my job at Universal Studios, <laughs> and I was doing the Harry Potter thing, and I had nowhere to go. I'm like, where do I take this audition? You were dressed as Hermione <laughs> Granger. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I'm looking around, there's explosions in the back from Waterworld. I'm like, I have to take this call. I have another audition. And then I thought it was a joke, actually. Like, I, like, there's no way that this is really happening for us. I feel like we all, I don't know, never even dreamed that this could happen and that we could be pink ladies of anything, you know, that pink ladies could look like us. And it's just, it's surreal and it's so magical and we're so honored. It's so fun. I mean, Cheyenne, the, the, so the producers told all of you guys, oh, it's one more audition. Then they said, surprise, you have the part. Yeah. <laughs> we're not auditioning you, we're your producers. Yeah. So what was it like to bond? Because the pink ladies, you know, they have that connection, but you all were strangers. How did you guys get together and really kind of yeah. get to know each other? The first time we actually met was during a fire alarm yeah. at our hotel. <laughs> That's a bonding yeah. experience. <laughs> yeah. 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 Out of the we all were in PJs. We <laughs> came downstairs. We're like, oh, oh. But we actually had our first like day zero of filming and that was we did this number where we all have to like stand on a bed and it rises and all this stuff happens and um, we got to hold hands and I think that was our really like bonding moment where we were like oh my god that's happening. Talk about throwing you right into it day yes. zero before before any line of dialogue is shot you guys are out there singing these songs. What was yeah. that like? It was a song first, yeah. It's called Different This Year, Reprise. Oh. And um, I think that we were just going through what our characters were going through. And yeah. It really just reaches through the screen. And um, it was pretty surreal. And with the song being called Different This Year, I think we all realized it might be a little different this, this year for us <laughs> moving forward. So it was a very uh, perfect um, situation. Ari, what does it feel like to be in this moment where you, you're you part of a huge show, something that people are so excited about? It's such a beloved franchise. Mm -hmm. And here you all are on the cusp of your big break. It's amazing. I mean, I, I, I can speak for all of us, I think, when I say that we grew up watching this film, knowing the music, loving these characters, loving the story in this world. And then to be able to come and, and in our big moment for yeah. ourselves as actors and people to be a part of the story and tell new ones and, and build on, on what um, the amazing actors, Olivia and all of them did um, back then to be able to to recreate that and bring something new and fresh and um, and bring new music and new dance moves and new characters to this franchise is just like it's just a dream. Well, sign me up. I've always wanted to be a Pink Lady, so I hope I know I'm a little old now, <laughs> but I'd like to join the crew. We're so proud of you and happy for you. Thank you so much. They're back with more in the fourth hour. Look forward to that. You can stream Grease: Rise of the Pink Ladies starting this Thursday on Paramount Plus. Al, over to you. I don't know. I see a cameo. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. The Absolutely. old pink lady. Yeah. <laughs> well, next up, we've got an inspiring member of our Start Today walking community who made some inspiring changes herself, turning her life around. But first, this is Today on NBC.
We're back with a big success story directly from our Start Today Facebook group. Walking literally saved the life of one of our members who hasn't looked back since joining our challenge. We're going to talk to Pamela Wampler in just a moment. But first, NBC's Kristen Dahlgren has her story. Kristen. Hey, good morning. 140,000 of you have now joined us to lead healthier lives. For Pamela, it was exactly what she needed to transform her life by putting down the wine and picking up walking. Pamela Wampler started to drink socially at around 40. Just to kind of hang out with my friends. It was just a time to kind of get together and have a good time. A busy mom to two boys, the wine seemed to help her unwind. I realized I just need a glass of wine to settle myself down. So I felt like I could be relaxed enough to help them do their homework. Soon one glass turned into two. At what point did you realize it was a problem? I don't know, honestly, when it started a year ago, it was up to about two bottles a night. It was when I'm happy, I need a glass. When I'm sad, I need a glass. It was the first thing I thought of that I needed to reach to. But as she downed those glasses, Pamela noticed her weight creeping up. And how much weight did you gain? Probably over the last three, four years, I had gained 70 pounds. She couldn't do the things she enjoyed, like surfing with her family. I couldn't fit in my wetsuit anymore, and it was very embarrassing. But it was more than embarrassment. Pamela's doctor was concerned. My doctor had told me that I was at the beginning stages of liver failure. She was told she wouldn't be considered for a liver transplant because she was an alcoholic. I was thinking, I'm just a mom who drinks wine. How in the world could I be an alcoholic? The doctor gave me a choice. It's wine or your life. Even then, Pamela didn't want to give it up until one day she almost went too far. I went out drinking with friends and I was ready to get in my car and drive. And I can't believe I was willing to do it. And it scared me on a mission to improve their health. We've got fitness trainer Stephanie Mansoor. It was then she saw a segment on the Today Show that would change her life. They were talking about Start Today, and I thought, this is what I need. She joined the Facebook group. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to share little bits. And even about my sobriety and the words of encouragement that I got just kind of helped me. Instead of reaching for that glass of wine, Pamela and her husband began to walk. At first, not far. So it started with that walk around the block. How much are you walking now? We walk about three to three and a half miles a day. She also hasn't had a glass of wine. How much weight have you lost? As of today, 53 pounds. Now she walks in 5Ks and added in an exercise bike. Now Pamela is the inspiration for others wanting to start today to live a healthier life. I mean, I was on the verge of liver failure, and now it's like I can't wait to get out there every single day and walk. It's, I thrive on it. This is such a special community with thousands of people posting their victories, their encouragement on the Start Today Facebook page. And Pamela says that was really a key to her success, guys. Oh, uh, thanks, mm -hmm. Kristen. And we, we also want to mention you can join the Start Today community by scanning our QR code. We're going to have a little bit more on that in just a moment. But right now we are so happy because we have Pamela with us. What an inspiring story. Mm. Wow. I think everyone has their moment that you can put your finger on when everything's going to change. Will you remind us about that moment where you turned on the show and you saw this thing and you decided, like, it's kind of now or never? I mean, it's crazy. It's just I, I realized that this is the time I need to do this. This is the time that I need to change my life and I need to live a healthier time. You had to hit rock bottom, it sounds like, because I think a lot of people go down a slope, but yep. you don't hit bottom, but you had to hit bottom with that uh, when you were almost about to go drinking and driving. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And then you decided, I mean, which I think is really brave, you shared this on our Facebook page. What made you decide to do that? I think just reading other people's posts and they were sharing their struggles and their triumphs, and I felt safe. I didn't know these people. And I think just not knowing these people mm. kind of made it safe for me to want to share. Well, you know, it's so weird because on social media, there are so few places where if you post something, you don't get bombarded with meanies yeah. just because of the way life is. But this is this is a safe place. Mm -hmm. Now, 
to go from where you were on day one to where you are today, you said you've dropped 53 pounds, you feel better. How has that process been for you? It's been fantastic. It's mm -hmm. like I feel more powerful. I feel better about myself. I feel like I can get up in the morning and conquer um, just life. Mm -hmm. I feel better. You have, a, yeah. you have that look. <laughs> and, and and I know uh, Stephanie Mansour is part of our walk today. Yeah. Le she's our leader. So yeah. we thought that she really would like to meet you. Yeah. So, Steph, come on out. <laughs> no way. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Hi. Congratulations, Thank you. Pamela. I'm oh my so gosh. proud of you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes. That's awesome. Yes. Steph, why do you think Pamela's story is so yeah. inspirational? You know, we can all relate to Pamela's story, guys, because we all have an unhealthy habit or two that we're looking to kick to the curb. And Pamela's just happened to be, you know, going for that glass of wine after work. Some of us go home and we're looking forward to raiding the cupboards and getting our junk food or ordering delivery. Mm -hmm. But instead of just, you know, kicking that habit to the curb, Pamela picked up a healthier habit. And it's what I like to call a transition walk. You yeah. transitioned from your chaos stressful day into a healthier happier more relaxing mm -hmm. evening that you're proud of and it helps you reach your goals so I think we can all relate to that not only kicking the cabinet mm -hmm. but also replacing it with a healthier right. one and Pamela we got a little surprise you're gonna be back in our third hour with Stephanie to work out with your husband yes. all right yes. By the way, what an inspiration you really just showed that it can be done congratulations Thank that's you. great we're Thank so happy you. for you scan that Thank QR you. code yes. or head to today.com slash start today to join our community Mm -hmm. Back in a moment, but first, your local news and weather. You did a good Pamela. Morning, Morning, Good morning. Welcome to you today. I love mornings. They're full of possibility. And how you start your day sets the tone for the whole day. We need to pull up one extra chair at the table. We feel like we're right there with you. Just ahead in this half hour, we're going to introduce you to Because every day we start our morning so you can take on yours. This morning on the third hour of today, go Tigers. A turnaround for the ages. The women of LSU taking home the school's first ever NCAA championship. Coach Kim Mulkey joining us live to talk about the big win and that courtside fashion. Plus, UConn and San Diego State face off tonight in the men's final. Then a Today exclusive director, Justine Bateman, here helping us embrace aging saying forget about your face her empowering message for all of us and spring is sprung we're getting crafty with diy home decor for the whole family today monday april 3rd 2023 live from studio 1a in rockefeller plaza this is the third hour of today 
I feel great this oh, morning. Good. And why do I feel great? Because all my friends oh, yeah. are back oh, together. Shamir, Craig, hey. Dylan, What's we nice? are all here. First of all, the glow coming <laughs> off of Chanel Jones. I mean, this is this time is I realized that I was, had so much sun, but as Dylan says, it's Panama. We went to Panama. <laughs> wow. This was the trip that we were supposed to take in 2020. Oh. Yeah. And because of COVID, it was postponed. Um, oh, so look at how big wait, the kids that, have gotten. No, that's Clara. Get out of here. This I was that was you. No, that's Clara. We so we did skiing and. What? That's surfing. the best vacation ever. Did so you right, ski? My, they, I left them. Surfboarding and skiing. I know. How far the kid, was the boys from where you were. So before we surfing. left, they went surf. They went skiing. Oh. oh. And then we got on a plane and went to Panama. I mean, he, we squeezed great. it all in. They so. have sunblock in Panama. I used seventy. <laughs> Did you? If I, I we'll do another segment with the dermatologist. I have, I think this is like skin poisoning. Ooh, somebody's been scratching poisoning. some bug bites. Okay, put that down. My whole body's put that down. covered. Put that down. All right, what about you? Put that down. <laughs> How was your weekend now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't quite that much fun, but it was a good time. Uh, I was up at our house. Uh, Courtney and I are working on a cookbook. Oh, together. that's Broke awesome. Broker family table. I love and that. And so uh, we were we were doing all these uh, uh, setups for for the book for the cook. Uh, Can the we cooking. do a taste testing? Uh, for we will. Before we, will do, we will that's do that. A lot of work to do. It all is. The it prep really work is. Perfect. And 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 the baby at one point kicked her. Oh, that's what she and said. And she. <laughs> Oh. Was like down for the count for about 15 minutes. Oh and wow! We had, a, we had a really good. <laughs> that time. baby's got some legs. Oh yeah, she's got some. She's got some. Oh. So How about you, Mr. Funny. Melvin? We had a fun weekend. I, okay. had, I went down to South Carolina on Friday for an event and stayed until Saturday, and then Sunday went to church. Lindsay okay. was traveling, so I had the kids by mm -hmm. myself. Palm it's Sunday. Palm Sunday. Okay. That's so, a long oh. mess. Sibby was passing out uh, some of the palms there, <laughs> and they gave out bunnies. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny they had a petting zoo after service. At church. At church. Well, well for the kids who right. sit through a service. Like yeah, that. exactly. You need a Blessing of the animals. Yes. It was a bunny, and then there's there me and a donkey. Wow. What? No, oh, now the joke. 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 I, I paused just wow. for now. Wow. No, just, it, have a it's filter. rare that you get to see the front and the back at the same coming. time. I, that's why I gave him the picture. How about you? In my ear, they said, Dylan? Wow. <laughs> oh, Dylan got to play well, in the Augusta National? I, it, everybody's like, did you get to play while you were down at Augusta National? No, I don't get to play. But oh. um, it was f so fun to be down there. I got to host an event at Berkman's Place, which is a very special place at Augusta National on Friday night. No cell phones allowed, so I do not have oh, any oh, pictures. That's wow. special, though. You are not allowed to bring a cell phone anywhere near huh. there. Um, and then after that, the boys were napping. Calvin was watching hockey with Brian, and I just laid outside in the sun like a bear. There you go. Um, <laughs> like an actual bear. Oh, wow. You were being serious. Oh, yeah, I actually did. Full on Sherpa. Thanks, Joe Martin. Um, literally, <laughs> I, it's my favorite thing to do. Oh, out of the Just beach, they don't have chairs. <laughs> when the boys nap, you nap. Yeah, tell oh, that that's good. it. That's <laughs> it. So many questions. Yes. Wow. Yeah. But, but you look like we'll you're having that a good time. Good time. It is good yeah. to be back. A lot of you probably spent your weekend watching college basketball. I texted Craig after, oh. after South Carolina. That's, uh, let me tell you, that South Carolina game was hard to watch mm. on, uh, on Friday. But on the women's side, LSU. They did it. They captured the national championship, and they did it for the first time in school history. Wow. That, that's for men's and women's, yes. by the way. Yeah. Uh, as for the men, UConn facing San Diego State tonight in the finals. Oh. After that buzzer beater of a finish, they were they, they were behind the entire game. Yeah. Wow. But, and, and, but they pulled ahead when it counted. There you go. <laughs> And NBC's Sam Brock is in Houston. He's been covering this for a long time, that game. Uh, obviously, Sam, that's where that game was played. How are you doing this morning? Yes, side of the final four. I am fantastic, Dylan. Hopefully you guys are as well. The brackets that nobody saw coming continue to keep folks on the edge of their seats. That game-winning shot you just referenced from Lamont Butler was right over there, the only time in the second half that the Aztecs were actually leading as time expired. On the women's side, Coach Mulkey just did something that has never been done in the history of college basketball, win titles with two different schools. LSU has captured its very first national championship. This morning, LSU making history with a commanding 17-point win over the University of Iowa, something that brought Coach Kim Mulkey to tears. Going from a losing record to champions in just two years. I think my tears are tears of joy. In the process, they bested supernova Iowa guard Caitlin Clark, who broke an NCAA record for most points in a tournament, while on the men's side, Lamont Butler etching his name in NCAA tournament lore. It's Butler with two seconds. He's got to put it up. 
the junior from Southern California, ending Florida Atlantic's inspiring run with a buzzer beater for the ages, sending the San Diego State Aztecs to their first national championship game. When you were a kid, did you dream of a moment like this? In the driveway, I used to have a, a, a court that I used to, to play on, and it was a bunch of like three, two, one shot. It was for sure a dream come true. The dream season for the Aztecs, both elating their fans. I, I still can't describe it because it all happened so quick. Like it's literally like time stopped and then you hear screaming. And robbing the FAU Owls of an even deeper run. If you had to pick an adjective, what would you use? I, I would just say crushing. Facing off against the Aztecs tonight for all the marbles, the Yukon Huskies, one of only six teams ever to win their first five games by double digits. The sports world also getting a boost from Lamont Butler's strength. His sister was murdered 14 months ago, but he told me she definitely got the assist on that last second buzzer beater. I think she was with me with that shot. She probably got the ball in a little bit, so I miss her and I'm just happy I'm able to do this for her. And Butler's shot almost didn't happen, guys. He was a fraction of an inch from stepping out of bounds. As for Mulkey, a testament to what she's accomplished with LSU. Before she arrived the season before, nine wins for the team. Now, they're national champions. Mm -hmm. wow. Back to you guys. Hey, oh, great. hey, Sam, you're not allowed to take a shot, are you? <laughs> Do you really want that? Yeah. I don't think the producers want to see that. I don't think America wants to see that. We want to see it. I didn't know if you'd get in trouble, but we're very curious. <laughs> You've been covering basketball for. Oh yeah, there we go. There we go. And Sam is really tall, so he's oh, got. He's got. Oh, oh, that's great. That's great because he's going to do this. Sam, thank you. Sam, Sam, thank you. We appreciate. We put you. We put you under pressure. Sorry, bud. Sorry. Yeah. Next time. Oh, stop right. it, Craig. Let's, let's bring in LSU women's basketball coach Kim Mulkey. Uh, congratulations, coach. Thank you for being here. Morning, good morning. Watch you guys every morning. Oh, thank you. Thank you. High praise Tell indeed. Bush. Yeah, Jenna there Bush. you go. We're all here. So LSU <laughs> LSU Tigers, NCAA champs, first time in the school's history. Has it even sunken in yet? No, because I haven't slept. That's why <laughs> I, I kept this hat on, no makeup. Threw a little bit of uh, rouge or, or blush on and put some earrings on so I could look presentable. <laughs> Listen, it's all right with us. Your enthusiasm on the sidelines was palpable. You were all over the court, even colliding uh, with an official at one point. What were your emotions like during that game? I, I'm sure it was an emotional roller coaster. Well, I, I coach very intense and passionate. I played that way. Um, I just feel everything those kids feel out there on the floor, and I lost it with about a minute and a half to go. We were up about 16, and I said, there's no way we can lose this game, and then the tears started flowing. Mm. <laughs> Coach, while we have you, I do want to ask you about one of your players, Angel Reese, most outstanding player. She tweeted out a photo of her last night from the game, and in the moment she flashes that that you can't see me sign at Iowa star player, Caitlin Clark. This photo has got more than 8 million views and she got some criticism for the gesture. And then at the post game presser, Angel went on to say, quote, all year I was critiqued about who I was. I don't fit the narrative. I don't fit in the box that y'all want me to be in. I'm too hood. I'm too ghetto. Y'all told me that all year, but when other people do it, y'all say nothing. So this is for all the girls that look like me. What, what do you make of the back and forth coach? Well, I don't know much about social media, and that's the truth. So after the press conference, I said, what's going on? And they said she did to uh, Caitlin Clark what Caitlin did to the South Carolina uh, – uh, I'm sorry, one of the teams and did the same thing. I don't even know what that means. And so she was, I guess, doing it back at her, and she was upset because – they attack her, but they didn't attack Caitlin and things like that. Listen, that child is a beast on the boards rebounding. That child just won a national championship. She's not afraid of social media. That is who Angel is. She trash talks on the court, but she doesn't cross really the line of vulgarity. She's mm -hmm. had technicals call this year. And um, she's not going to apologize for it. Now, if I ever have to get involved, she knows that. <laughs> Don't misrepresent our university. Don't make us look bad. But, guys, social media is the world we live in, like it or not. That's true. Yeah. Um, Coach, you know, also uh, creating quite the buzz was your courtside fashion. Yeah. Oh, seeing what you were going to wear next. I mean, what inspired your outfits each game? Did you have a favorite? 
No, I don't have a favorite. And let me quickly tell you, I know we probably are limited on time, but I've always dressed nice. I'm, I'm one of these that wanted to wear an, uh, a new outfit every day in grade school. I love it. When I moved back home to Louisiana, we like glitter. We like feathers. Mm -hmm. We like leather. You know, that's who we are in Louisiana. And we have LSU graduates that are these famous stylists and designers. And they start sending me things and just ask me to wear it. That's awesome. And I do. I get talked into it. I tell them some of this stuff I can't wear. I'm 60 years old. You just don't <laughs> go there. But some of it you do. And uh, if it helps them and it helps buy somebody buy one more ticket to a women's basketball game, I've done my job. Well, you, awesome. you we have more it. than done your job, <laughs> That's Coach. Right. You and your team, congratulations again to you and all the LSU Tigers. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tell Hoda. Give us a shout out. She uh, spent a lot of time in New Orleans. Oh, she's she mad. Has she did this That's morning. That is for sure. Thank you so Thank much. You, congratulations. And hopefully you can get some sleep. Maybe tomorrow. I will. Thank Maybe you, tomorrow. Guys. All, All right, right. Take, take care. care Whoever, whatever team you back, the, the the moment that women's basketball is experiencing right now in our yes. society, I, I've never seen so many people so excited oh, sure. about watching. NCAA basketball. tickets more expensive for the women than the men. First time ever. Yeah, that that probably the phenomenal. ratings were going to. That be is higher. awesome. All right. Well, we have a lot more ahead today on the third hour, including a conversation about aging gracefully. Justine Bateman is here, reminding us to love the way we look. No matter what age, Amen. I hear that. We'll be right back. Amen. <laughs> Today exclusive as we continue an important conversation about women and aging with director and author Justine Bateman. We first got to know her from the 80s classic Family Ties, and she has been a writer and director for decades. Well, now she is making headlines for a recent interview responding to online criticism that her face, quote, looks old. Her message was simple. I don't give a bleep and quote, <laughs> I like it. And it's something a lot of us women are happy to hear. Justine, good morning to you. Hi. Good morning. Good, welcome so back. listen, a lot of people, especially these days in times of social media and magazines, and it's been this way for a long time, but I feel like now more than ever, we're, especially women, are particularly aware of our faces and Botox and aging and all of the things. Why did you decide to say, you know what, enough is enough. I'm going to talk about this. Well, I wrote a book about it two years ago, so it's funny to see it sort of bubble up again. Mm -hmm. you know, so obviously people, uh, people are still very passionate about it, as it, as it should be. Um, but it really, uh, uh, the bottom line is the fear. What is the fear behind it? If people think I look old, then therefore, and there's some fill in the blank, and whatever that fill in the blank is for somebody, that's the thing to deal with, because there's nothing, it, that's something that existed before their face started changing. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity for them to get, get rid of that fear, which is what I did when I processed it, uh, when this came up, when I was writing my first book, Fame. You know, it, it's funny because we, we look at, you know, male actors as they get into their 50s yeah. and 60s and, and even 70s and, and beyond, and they become distinguished. Mm -hmm. and this, whereas women aren't afforded that same, that same luxury. Do you think that that's starting to change a little bit? I don't, when you say it's starting to change a little bit, meaning like does society as a whole, are they going to think differently about it? I don't really... Personally, I don't really care what mm -hmm. society as a whole thinks or what the cosmetic industry thinks. I'm not here to try and change any of that. I'm just saying I got on the other side of that bothering me by looking at what my core fear was, which had nothing to do with my skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for each individual that wants to get on the other side of it, there's an opportunity for them. And I guess uh, as far that. as Hollywood is concerned. Well, Hollywood's just selling what you, the viewer, wants to see. Mm -hmm. So if you, the viewer, wants to see older faces, that's what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. Hollywood is just a business trying to 
appeal to as many people as possible. And so is the cosmetics industry And as so well. is the cosmetics yeah. industry. Big in fact, business. they'll sell the same product in another country with a different name. Like, in France, it's not going to be anti-aging. It's going to be, you know, skin enhancing or whatever. Oh, mm-hmm. I, didn't, I never knew that. But that's, that's what advertising and marketing is supposed to do. Either attend to a need you appear to have yeah. or to create a need they think you should have to sell this. And I think it's fascinating. But for people who are prone to criticize themselves based on all of these things, I think if you just get at what your fear is underneath mm-hmm. all of that, then you'll see that advertising and you'll just, it won't affect you, it won't push yeah. your buttons. I feel like this also comes down to confidence, you know, like literally being comfortable in your own skin. Saying, you know, whatever your thoughts, I don't care because I'm living my life and I'm doing my thing. Like how, how freeing is it to just get to that point mentally, to just be comfortable and, and to be you? Yeah, that's that's really it. And that the only way I know how to get there is to a- attend to the fears. And because unless I do that, then uh, you're just like doing positive thinking or something, which you've still got a bunch of stuff under the rug. <laughs> so you got to get rid of the stuff under the rug. Um, mm. But I'm really, you know, we're we're putting together a film of the of the book face that I wrote mm-hmm. um, about this topic. And um with like Mary Louise Parker, Carrie Ann Moss, and all these fantastic actresses. And so it'll, you know, send that message out to more yeah. people. Really, qu- really quickly, Justin, do you yeah. think that this collective fear that, that we seem to have as a society of aging at its root is we, we, we're all concerned about our mo- own mortality? Like it, all, it forces us to deal with the, with the fact that we're not going to be around forever. That could be what it is for some people, you know? Mm. For other people, it might be, oh, I'm afraid nobody's gonna listen to me anymore. I'm afraid I'm not gonna get a maid or I'm gonna lose a job or never get my dream job or whatever it is. We'll deal with that fear. Mm -hmm. Because that doesn't have anything to do with the skin on your face. It's a good conversation to have, you know, and I think the conversation obviously will continue. You're the first person I've ever heard um, connect aging to fear. Mm-hmm. Like as far as our physical, the, you know, what the way we look, I'd never heard that before. So it's something to think about. But it's not even it's not even just specific to aging. It's like, oh, somebody for someone it could be, oh, I'm afraid if I'm, you know, ten pounds heavier, mm-hmm. X will happen to right. me. Yeah. Yeah. Or if I'm, uh, if I wear my hair the way I really want to wear it, X will happen to yeah, me. Right. If you just deal with that X. The stuff under the carpet. Under the, the carpet. Yeah. Yeah. Bad news. Thank you. This is yeah. great. Yeah, Thank good you. conversation. Keep All talking. right. Up next, we are introducing you to Bird Girl, the young woman inspiring a new generation of climate activists. And then later, fresh out of the ring oh, yeah. and here in 1A, we are talking with some of WrestleMania 39's biggest winners. We'll be right back. Heck of a show. Good morning. back now with our series Today Climate. This morning we're sharing the story of one young woman inspiring so many around the world. Her name's Maya Rose Craig. She's a bird watcher and an environmentalist. And now, well now she's an accomplished author as well. And she's just 20 years old, by the way. Her new book is called Bird Girl. Well, NBC's Molly Hunter met up with her and joins us from a popular bird watching spot in the UK, the London Wetland Center. Hey, good morning, Molly. <laughs> 
Hey guys, good morning. Lots of birds around actually we've seen this morning, but I did get to spend some personal time bird watching with the expert, with Bird Girl herself, just 20 years old, as you guys mentioned, unbelievably accomplished. And she started bird watching at just nine years old. Take a look. Some of my favorite birds are out there, which is great crested grebes. I just think they're so beautiful. Her eyes are expertly trained on any movement. Maya Rose Craig is the youngest person to see half the world's bird species. A staggering 5,410, and she's counting every single one. Now documenting many of those encounters and her own fledgling years in her new book, Bird Girl. Bird watching is such a difficult hobby to explain to people. <laughs> I just have this like very deep rooted love of birds and nature. Like I think birds are so beautiful. And sort of on top of that, it's sort of the almost adrenaline rush of like, will you see it? Won't you see it? The moment where you finally do see it is just like, yes. And it feels just amazing. At age 20, she's a veteran twitcher, as they call it here, with nearly two decades of experience. And we meet her on home turf. One of my favorite spots is actually just around the corner where we've been getting a raven nest for years now. Born to avid birders, parents Chris and Helena started her young, some 40 countries, all seven continents, seeking the thrill of it, the escape, and that moment she first experienced at eight years old. I just remember spotting the hummingbird feeders out in the garden and spotting all of the hummingbirds sort of darting around. And it was just this moment that I was like, I love birds, I love nature, <laughs> like they were just amazing. But Maya was always aware that she had access to places that others who looked like her didn't. At age 13, launching the organization Black to Nature. It was only once I'd already set up Black to Nature, I was already working with kids on the ground and I started doing more campaigning, that I realized the issue was um, much bigger and much more systemic than I'd realized before. Her public profile soared, but at home behind closed doors, the family was navigating her mother's severe bipolar disorder. There's a lot of stuff in the book that I'd never really talked about before, even with my parents, let alone with the world. Maya says throughout her teenage years, birding kept their family together. I think birds are sort of very representative of that love that me and my family have for each other and sort of the way that we've stuck with each other through all of it. By age 17, she was marching in her hometown with climate activist Greta Thunberg and later that year in the Arctic with Greenpeace staging an icy impromptu youth strike. I just felt like I was watching the Arctic melt around me basically and it was really upsetting and I ended up being feeling really angry, which is why um, I ended up doing a youth strike for climate out on the ice. But it's her mother's home country, Bangladesh, which grounds her activism. In terms of climate change, emphasizing the human loss and the people in countries like Bangladesh, where my family's from, who are really struggling. And through her social media platforms, while she certainly attracts avid bird watchers, she also embodies that Gen Z fighting spirit, which intersects climate activism with a global struggle for justice. She lights up when talking about birds, but for her, it's all connected. When I feel very strongly about things, whether that is race equality or climate change, I'm, I go out and I try and do something about that. So I think sort of campaigning and activism are always going to be in my future. I think I'm probably going to be talking about climate change for a very long time. You guys, she was just awesome. This was one of those really tough assignments we had to spend all day outside and spend it with a really impressive young woman. As far as what's next, you gotta believe that environmental activism and birds are defi definitely, excuse me, gonna be part of her career. Like we said, she's only 20. She has a year left at Cambridge, but this is gonna be a career to watch. As far as me, this afternoon, we've got some birds to watch. Oh, uh, Molly, I you saw that. some fantastic birds oh, out there. Oh, that was beautiful. incredible. It's Thanks so much day. for bringing us. That mm -hmm. was really good. Bird girl. Yeah. Well, coming up next, we've got some superstars in the house. Three of this weekend's WrestleMania champs joining us live yes. for their victory lap. And maybe uh, they'll show Craig a move or two. Oh, uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> then later, nothing says April showers like an umbrella wreath. That's right. We're learning some fun oh, and cute. easy DIY decor for that's spring. Tomorrow. Third hour of today, we'll be right back. Yes, we. No, that's an umbrella, Craig. Thank that's you. Cute. Ella, Ella.
Watch out for folding chairs because fresh <laughs> off this weekend's WrestleMania 39 at SoFi Stadium, we have not one, not two, but three WWE champions right here in studio. I caught some of this over the weekend. On Saturday night, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn took down the Usas in the main event to become the new undisputed WWE Tag Team Champions. Mm -hmm. And just last night, Bianca Blair, Bianca Belair, she defeated Asuka to success successfully defend her title as WWE Raw Women's Champion. And they all just landed from an overnight cross-country <laughs> trip from landed. Hollywood wow. to be here with us. Huge weekend event. Yeah. I'm going to start with you because you've gotten the least amount of sleep. <laughs> How you feel? You were like 12 hours ago. I think you were in the ring, if my math is, is right. How are you feeling? I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling great. You know, I'm riding off the momentum of, of walking out as the Raw Men's Champion. Woo! I was able to go from WrestleMania last year to this WrestleMania. So, you know, I went 3P at WrestleMania. So, did it in Hollywood, in L.A. And it was just, it was great. Oh my gosh. And, I, and I'm happy to be here this morning. And you did it in front of 80,000 people. 80, what, what was it like people. to defend your title in that environment? It was amazing. Um, I think that's the biggest crowd I've ever been in front of. Wow. It was 80,000 people. But most importantly, my family was there. Mm -hmm. My mom, my dad, all the you know the kids were there front row, so it was a great night. It's such a dream for all of you guys. Craig and I talked about how back in the day we used to watch you know wrestling and wanted to be those guys. I used to <laughs> beg my parents to watch a pay per view, uh -huh. but to be in the ring, I can't even imagine. For the two of you, Sammy, not to be outdone in Saturday night's main event, you and Kevin won your first WWE Tag Team Championships. Has that sunk in yet? Uh, it's a little surreal because we go way, way back. Yeah. Actually, so, and we were those same fans. We just took it too far, basically. <laughs> <laughs> we just didn't know when to stop. And um, no. just kept going in a straight line, even after starting, you know, over 20 years together in Montreal, kind of as a team, kind of coming up together to put a bow on the story at WrestleMania of all places in L.A. I mean, <laughs> it's it's still not fully sunk in, to be yeah, honest. Awesome. Yeah. So, Kevin, how do you make this work? Because you guys, you're friends, but you're also rivals so yeah well how, so how do what you do i that? always say is we're more like brothers than friends mm -hmm. we started wrestling like you said uh, together over 20 years ago on the quebec uh, independent wrestling scene back in canada and we were kind of just getting on shows together everywhere so we'd have to drive together everywhere when we started going to the united states to make our name we had to fly everywhere together so we weren't really given a choice so you know when you're born you're born into a family you can't that's choose true. your siblings that's yep. a good point that's uh, that's kind of what happened yeah. here so we had to get we had to get along whether we liked it or not you know we, we got along anyway that worked out we learned to do that. wrestlemania for folks who don't follow this point I mean, it's the super bowl of wrestling yeah. yeah this was the first time that the tag team match was actually the featured match usually it's a, it's one-on-one -on -one. yeah not to give away too much, because there might be some folks who still want to go sure. back and watch. Yeah, but no spoilers. you guys, you showed up last night also to help Cody Rhodes, son of the great Dusty Rhodes, by the way. You try to help Cody Rhodes against Roman Reigns. What would be your message to fans about the outcome of that? Mm. Uh, well, you know, uh, we did our best to make things right. And uh, once again, we kept the Usos uh they didn't belong in that match. We made sure they didn't have too big of an impact on everything that happened. And, uh, you know, it, it just went the way it was. I don't know. That's a good way not yeah. to get way too yeah. much. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I tried. Yeah. Real ambiguous. Yeah. 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 Bianca, we, we have to ask because I know you and your husband, fellow WWE superstar Montez Ford, you started this reality show. Yes. How's taping going? Were they there last night? I mean, what what's going on? Yeah, we've started. You know, we started at um, January on the World to WrestleMania at Royal Rumble, and we filmed this weekend at WrestleMania, and, you know, we got to get all the craziness and chaos mm -hmm. and, you know, the audience of 80,000 people and how big WrestleMania is. So we got to capture that and show us inside the ring, but also outside the ring, you know, in, in mm -hmm. our family. So it's, it's, I'm very excited for it. Yeah, that's the awesome. Golden age of wrestling continues. Mm -hmm. Congrats. Congrats to all <laughs> of you, Bianca, Sammy, thank you. Kevin. Thank you. Thank you uh, by the way, the fallout from WrestleMania continues on the biggest Monday Night Raw of the year live tonight, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central, over on USA Network. And you can catch up on the weekend's excitement only on Peacock, of course, both part of our parent company. It's All awesome. right, coming up, we are decorating for spring and recycling, too. How to turn your old containers into gardening tools, and the kids will love it. We'll be right back. Are you still...
Spring has sprung, and if you are looking for ways to spruce up your neck, where am I going? This way? Yeah. Here. Your neck, your neck gets Boy, better that for the season. Still I know, right? <laughs> we have you covered this morning. That sun burnt your brain. Know, exactly. <laughs> All right, lifestyle influencer Shannon Doherty is back this morning with some great ideas for the whole family to make any spring party blossom. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You always Thank get us in the spirit of whatever season we're heading into. I, I love am this. So excited for spring. I am ready for it and having spring parties at our house. So I wanted to show you guys some easy ways. You can decorate with things you have at home. This is really cute. cute. First, the entrance, your door wreath. This is just an umbrella and some fake tulips. It's so <laughs> oh, wow. easy to make, and it looks really cute. It's yeah. cute. April showers bring May flowers, and we are ready. And people are talking, you know, as they enter the door. As like, they oh, enter. look at our door. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Seen I love another that. way that I thought was really cute for a wreath on your front door, just use seed packets. I got yeah. some ones that I love, like a forget-me-not and other pretty ones. Glue them so right colorful. on a wreath, and look. That's Look really cute. Perfect. And Al put you right on the, the door. Middle. Welcome to <laughs> right to your door. You always have such fun table runners. Yeah. So that way you don't have to mess up your placemats or you, you know you have to wear exactly. your own tablecloth. Easy cleanup yeah. that you can do. Quickly pick it up. My family actually helped me with this one. Cute. So you, I get this a large adorable. piece of craft paper. And again, with things you have at home, this is just an empty paper towel roll. Oh. You fold the top in to make a little oh. heart, uh -huh. and then the kids help you that's stamp cute. them into little butterflies. Oh, that's cute. Oh, that's and then cool. they draw the little And antlers. then they draw it on. They drew on the antlers, and it's a fun activity to do also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Saves time, and then you have a pretty table. It's really cute. Throw it out when this done. is my favorite. Place settings. I yeah. love these two. I love how these that's turned cute. out. These are very easy to make. Mm -hmm. I just use some artificial green grass, mm -hmm. artificial flowers. Where do you flowers. buy that? Just the craft store? I use the artificial just, green yeah. rest <laughs> yeah. Craft store, Amazon anywhere. Amazon. And then what I love for the place setting, again, I use the seed packets. Ah. This acts as a little gift that you can bring home with you, too. Mm -hmm. And amazing. then for the place setting, for the name tags, oh, I yeah. made these cute out of our fruit containers. You just put some plants in them, and I use a little plant tag with your name. That's, That's really cute. cute. Another Lovely. gift they can take home. And That's really cute. Really and you also cute. found a way to reuse these milk cartons. Yes. Yeah, so April is Earth Month in our mm -hmm. house, and I'm always teaching my kids a way to recycle and upcycle things. Milk cartons. Uh -huh. Save them. Pop some holes in the top, and they oh, become watering cans. Oh, oh they pop very holes nice. In the top. Yeah, and, and we the, decorated them with stickers. What are these? So those were for the table, oh. the place setting. Oh, okay. they're just fruit More containers. What did you use to so actually easy. Like, pop through the top? I use little scissors. You could oh, okay. use, yep, oh, and wow. you just. Decorate oh, that them is a and cute idea. Cereal box okay. reuse. Yes, so I gift love bags. this idea. Everyone needs a gift bag at their party or mm -hmm. you know a friend's birthday party. Use your cereal boxes. <laughs> Use pipe cleaners and shoelaces as the handles. Perfect gift bag. Recycle, upcycle. That's, That's Easy. perfect. And what is this? And, they're and colorful next, things. okay, again with some newspaper. Take your newspaper. Are you making sun hats? You're making sun hats. Oh, Another really fun activity That's if cute. you're having a family party for this spring. Little bonnets for mm -hmm. them. All you have to do is paint some newspaper, let mm -hmm. it dry, put some tape around it, decorate. Mm -hmm. Bonnets for your family. Oh, how cute yes. is that? Is just sun hats. Just oh, and, sun oh, hats. and you make a little, your outfit. little uh, <laughs> Easter cornhole. So every party needs a fun game. I made this bunny toss out yes. of a box we had at home. That's cute. Cut off the back. I used socks. Oh, so oh, close. Oh, look at this. Ah, yeah. A little hey. short. Socks and Shannon, thank you so much. Course. Really. What'd you put inside of the Coming socks? up next, we're uh, going to be toning night. up for the spring with so April Sports. Never, never played show. Coming. Let's get ready to move. It's real bad. Third hour of today, I'll be right back. <laughs> That's a great idea. Wow, I'm so glad my kids are grown. <laughs> <laughs>
You know, today is World Party Day, so oh. we're celebrating with another Start oh. Walking Monthly Woo. Walking Challenge. All you got to do is scan that QR code on your screen to sign up for the Today April Start Today newsletter with our monthly workout. Today, fitness contributor Stephanie Mansour is here with one of our Start Today members, Pamela Wampler. Pamela is inspiring all of us to live a healthier life. Earlier, she shared her sobriety journey, and Pamela's husband, Brent, is here with us as well. Good morning to all of you guys. I'm Good so morning. happy you're all here Thank this you. morning. <laughs> so Stephanie, Pamela um, shared, I, I should say, some very inspiring story earlier. She didn't know that she'd get to meet her. <laughs> and so now we're working out together. Kind of surreal, huh? What a day. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so in, in addition to walking, we're going to add mm -hmm. some resistance to our journey this yes. month, right? So we've got an easy way that you can really add strength training to your walking program. Okay. And that's by using these resistance bands. So we're going to start oh, off what with is, what the oh, it's, it's World Party Day. Party day. Oh. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> instead of, you know, great. reaching for that cocktail okay. or, you know, a traditional party, I want you to look at your workout as a party. You know, okay. before I became a trainer, and a coach, I dreaded exercise. And yeah. it wasn't until I changed that mindset and really thought, oh my gosh, this is fun. I'm going to smile. I'm going to have a great time. So our first exercise here is yeah. stepping on the band. So okay. we're going to step on the band with the feet about um, as wide as the hips, and we're going to do a bicep curl. So elbows hug in, we curl up, we repeat this exercise 10 times, and then we move on to the next exercise. Okay. And this is really effective because we're strengthening and toning and getting those arms much more in shape for the the spring mm -hmm. and summer and then the next exercise we do is for the upper back so anyone that's got posture issues mm -hmm. or even shoulder pain this is mm -hmm. great to strengthen the upper back abs in feet are staggered we're gonna open the arms out to the sides Ooh, good that looks great yes yeah, straight arms and lower down oh, and just yeah. lean forward a little bit at a 45 degree mm -hmm. angle yes that's great so Exhale. this is a circuit that you would be doing yes Steph? this is a circuit exactly Al so we repeat each exercise 10 times Steph, and move we, to the next do we hold at the top to no pin? you can just lower it back Back yeah. down. And that's the I thing actually, Craig, it. I love about resistance bands is we get that tension on the way up and, and on the, the way, way down. down. And you can you can get them uh, for different resistance. Exactly. So I got us the light version with the handles, but we're going to move on to these um, what we call kind of booty bands. Booty now, band. we've oh, got booty light. Band. We've uh, got light, but Craig has heavy. He brought his own. You want it heavy? <laughs> well, there's a little more booty there. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We got to work it out extra hard. So we're going to step into the bands okay. here. And if you can't do this, at home or if this seems like it's going to be hands. too much balance, mm -hmm. you can do these exercises without right. the band. Okay. So we're going to start with the feet as wide as the hips, abs in, working the lower body now, and we're going to tap one foot out to Not the side, so working that outer hip. Nice. And then bring it back to center. Tap out and center. Keep going a little bit faster. Out and center. Oh, what is this doing for us? Out Stephanie? and center. We're working the outer oh, hip. That feels good. The thigh. Yes. This is great if you have low back pain. Mm -hmm. This is helping to stabilize and support the core. Right. And then we're going to do a backwards kick. So same leg. Oh. We're going to reach it back, try to oh, straighten that yeah. leg, work the glute and the hamstring. Awesome. Yes, good job, Pamela. And then come back to center. Reach Where, it back. What are you doing over there, oh. And center. Ooh, <laughs> you know what I love about this, Stephanie? The resistance bands don't cost a lot of money. That's uh -huh. right. And you can do it at home. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can throw expensive. these in your bag if you're yes. traveling. Exactly. Yes. We're really under easy. the couch, but make sure you remember yeah. them and get them back <laughs> out. Right. And we're having a party. That's right. Oh. We're having a party. Woo! Right. And we got to remember to drink to stay hydrated. That's right. We want to stay hydrated. So drinking so an cute. extra eight ounces of water per 15 minutes of exercise. Thank you. Oh, I love how Craig is. You know what it is with this, yeah. this cucumber water? Day. It helps cucumber. you drink more water. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Oh, it's it's yes. yeah. Fancy. Flavoring it with mint, cucumber, or even this just squeezing a little bit of yes. lemon or lime Make is it delicious. Sparkling. Oh, there you go, Pamela. Wow, let's get one to start. Yes. Excellent. There we go. So you can really turn your workout into a fun activity with your friends, your family. You know, even online. Join us today.com slash start today and get in our Facebook group. Here's you, Pamela. Cheers Brent. to you, Pamela. Yes. Thank, Thank you guys for coming. So Thank you so much. And don't forget, Cheers. if you want to start our start our well, you start our start join the community. Um, just go to today.com slash start today to join the online community. And another reminder, we are less than three weeks away from our first ever Start Today event. We're focused on wellness. It's gonna be so much fun. Olympic champion Allison Felix will stop by. Stephanie, I know you'll be oh, there is this too. We're going out to Sonoma. Yes, yes that's the right. show, the event, both sponsored by Sonoma County Tourism. We can't wait to see you there. It's going to be a good That's show. It's going to be a great show. A couple of shows. We'll be right back.
All right, great start to the week, and it's only going to get better. Guess what? Tomorrow on the third hour, basketball legend Magic Johnson stuff. I love Magic. Yes. Uh -huh. Up next, though, the band American Authors performing live in Hoda and Jenna with their new, brand new song, Best Night of My Life. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Today, get ready for the rise of the pink ladies when the stars of the new series take us back to Rydell High. Plus, a multi-talented couple, Leslie Odom Jr. and Nicolette Robinson on their most precious project yet. And the winners and big moments from last night's star-studded CMT Awards. So get up. It's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. So get hey, 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 guys, welcome in. It is Monday, April 3rd. How we doing? You're looking good on a Monday. So are you. And are April you? is here. Did you get April fooled? Oh, Tell me what went down. Let's go with the, the Hager house. Come uh, on. Mila. Yep. Right before bed. Yes. Scooped out some peanut butter. Yes. And Holly, our cat, um, got neutered. She became a woman. Oh, she got neutered. She had a little blue cone. She looked like the hands made cat. <laughs> and so she said, uh oh. What? Because one of the things the doctor said to look for was vomit. So I walked in to put her to bed. And this is a good one because, you know, I was tired. And she scooped out a little peanut butter. On, she didn't put it on the rug because then I would have been really yeah, grumpy. But where'd she put, she put it? it on her bedside table and <gasps> said, Holly got sick. It smelled a little like <laughs> peanut butter. <laughs> So she didn't get me 100%. Um, I told the kids that I had to travel, but that's so mean. Okay, <laughs> why would you pull out that card? I was like, guys, oh no. It was a beautiful afternoon Saturday here and everybody was like playing in the backyard. Yeah. And I said, I have bad news. I just got a text, I have to go. And they were like, what? <laughs> I found the one little button to kind of so just bad. stick. What about you? Did you okay, do anything? These, these were our April Fool's tricks. So um, we put, the kids put tape on the bathroom, like clear tape with yes. the sticky side out. And then they went in and they said, we need you, we need you. And then you went running in and then you got tape on you and they fell out laughing. Like they had just, they had just like, they had done it. Like yes. they were like, we got you. Mila like, actually put tape on Poppy's faucet. I don't know where she read this, but what it makes you do is it when you squirts. turn on it, squirts in your face. <laughs> By the way, I love a kid and a good April Fool's. I Fool love show. April Fool's. I love an adult in April Fool's. Me Fool. too. Okay, right. did you watch this last night? The I did CMT? not see the t CMTs because there was so much happening last night. What else? Oh, yeah, I, basketball. I watched basketball. I watched 60 Minutes. Oh, that was what on. What was I doing? I, we right. watched Your Honor. Okay, there's a lot of good. You know what I'm into? What? Okay, I got a new show. Get oh. ready. Oh, no. Get ready. Oh. Write it down. Got to watch it. Unstable. Rob Lowe and his son. Oh, is it good? Thank you. Thank well, people, you. we were no, expecting. You got, you got to watch Rob Lowe and his son. You know why? They have such natural chemistry because they're father and son. Yeah. And it's a, it's hilarious. He plays this. Uh, Rob Lowe plays this egomaniac who runs a company. Yes. And, and anyway, it's brilliant and fun. Oh, good. We'll so, have to watch it. So anyway, we night. were binging too much. Yeah. But the CMTs yeah. were last night. Uh -huh. They were in Austin mm. at Moody Theater, which is my hometown spot. I love those awards. But okay. you know, they always put up cool mashups. I like when you put different genres together yes. that you wouldn't expect and all of a sudden you fall in love. And it also makes people fall in love with other music genres yes. that they haven't fallen in love with before. Totally. Okay, so for example, Gwen Stefani and Carly Pierce, they performed Just a Girl. Okay. Come on! She's been here before, don't you love her? Yes, but it's like kind of rocky. Yeah. 
Oh, stop it. Gwen. Gwen looks great. Gwen is cool. Come on. Sick. Come on. Ooh, I love that. Alanis Morissette. Yes. Hit the stage uh, to honor the next women of country with You Ought to Know. It's another class. Joined by Lainey Wilson, Ingrid uh, Andrus, Madeline Edwards, and Morgan Wade. How much fun. Wow. Ooh. Come on, they're all singing it. With the queen, too, with her. Totally. And you know they all sing it. And they it. know this song, because we all knew it. You, 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 I don't know. Don't you know they all sang that song with a hairbrush in front totally. of the mirror when, when they, they were, were kids? When they were little girls. I love that song. Me also too. ironic. Anything Alanis Morissette She's does. She's so good. It's so great. Okay, and then another beautiful mm. performance that really took our breath away was Winona Judd and Ashley McBride, and they performed Foreigners. I want to know what love is. Voices that are meant to be together. Yes. And that you never would have put them together. Ever. And then you hear them, and it's the most beautiful, beautiful sound. <sighs> oh my gosh. Um, by the way, Kane Brown was a big winner with his wife. Caitlin, yeah. They took him video of the year for their song, Thank God. Oh my God. I didn't um, even know do she was a, a singer, yeah. which I love. By the way, she's kind of like, they're both great singers, but he's kind of more in the spotlight. Yeah. And she's sort of like, well, okay. And he, he was always looking for a song they could sing together. And he would always say, how about this one? How about this one? And they came up with this one, which is called Thank God. And it's all about that and it love. Won, yes. And it oh. won the big award. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Also, the other big winner in the night, singer, songwriter, rapper, Jelly Roll. Jo Jelly Roll has just hit the country stage big time. He was nominated for three trophies, and he took home three trophies, including male video. He was of the nominated year. for three and took home three. It's a perfect batting average. Don't you love that? I didn't. I don't know Jelly Roll's song, which makes me feel like I'm old. Jelly Roll is. He's got. He's like a kind of rappy. I mean, you'll know it when you. Okay. Well, let's play it later. Okay. Um, a Quinta Brunson hosted Saturday Night Live. I can't believe I missed SNL I missed this it weekend. Too. But the great news about being on the internet is you can watch all of it. That's true. <laughs> but watch our show live, okay? Because yeah. why not? It's better. All right, so one of the most buzzed about sketches was a Netflix parody, Bridesmaid Cult documentary. Okay, let's see. Take a look. It all started with a box on my doorstep. And a note with a question. I just got this feeling that it wasn't the kind of question you could say no to. Will you be my... Bridesmaid. Each year, more than six million women fall into this type of cult. They prey on vulnerable groups like college roommates and sisters-in-law. They sell you on the big day. I thought it was a one-day commitment. But for 18 months, I was fully sucked in. I mean, there was an email chain, a group text, DMs, a whole conversation in the comments on Venmo. That's in a 200-question poll about customized shirts. We ended up going with Bride Tribe. <laughs> oh, I want more of that. I want to watch the whole thing. Wait, as a fellow Dateline, as a past Dateline yes, employee, yes, 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 yes. did that sort of that strike was, a nerve? By the way, that hit the perfect, that was like in the perfect lane, that. And I think someone who will relate to this completely is you, because most people, like myself, have been a bridesmaid probably a handful of times with dear friends over the years. I think I count probably four or five for me total. Okay. Now, in your young life, Miss Jenna Bushhager, how many times have you been a bridesmaid? Fourteen. Fourteen times. I know, but not Wait, any, I haven't pause, been a bridesmaid. Pie, pause. Fourteen, Fourteen. people yes. consider you. But one some probably Wait, don't anymore. One of your best. No, that's a, but you know what? Because that's... I'm from Texas where people no. got married early and then you kind of, that's what it's talking about, praying on college roommates. <laughs> I mean, I love, I love to everybody whose wedding I've been in. I don't know that I can name all of them sitting right here, <laughs> um, but it's like, that's the reason why. No, I don't mean that in a mean way. <laughs> I just mean that in a way. <laughs> 
just mean that in the truth. But I was happy to do it. And by the way, bachelor up parties are so fun. The problem is you grow out of them. <laughs> and now, when was it like we what should did you go do with all those dresses? I don't you, I mean, know. You, yeah. Were there any that you liked? No. No, no, no. no. There's never that a real Everybody one. says you'll wear it again. You'll shorten it. You'll wear it again. You're never going to wear it again. The you'll, you'll shorten it is never happening, ever. Wait, can we just say congratulations? To Talia. To Talia. Talia. The Talia. Alliance for Women and Media Foundation just announced yeah. the winners of their 48th annual Gracie Awards. And yeah. can we, uh, Talia, Talia won. Congratulations to our executive producer. She won a Gracie. She deserves it yes. wholeheartedly for uh, Entertainment TV Daytime Producer. It's Congratulations. It's her first Gracie. Now, yep. Hoda has probably won as many Gracies as I've been a bridesmaid. <laughs> Have you won 14 Gracies? I don't know. Pretty, pretty close. <laughs> she also won for interview feature for your incredible Iranian women but conversation. Can I just tell you, yeah, Elf, the producer, and I just want everyone to, the producer's name, and please remember it, is Yael Federbush. She is a great producer at uh, she the sure Today Show. Is. She's an award winner, and she is like, she's amazing. So are you. I like what you're trying to do there and deflect, okay. but you're an award winner. Yeah. Okay, y'all, we are so excited. Coming up, yes. Dean Bateman is here. She's changing the conversation about getting older. We'll talk with her coming up right after this. <laughs> Director, producer, and author Justine Bateman has been working in Hollywood for more than 30 years, so she's used her platform to share her views on aging, both in her 2021 book Face and the accompanying film. Yeah, now her recent interview with 60 Minutes Australia has reignited that conversation. Let's take a look. Well, when you say, is there beauty in aging, aren't you really saying, do you think it's possible for other people to find aging beautiful? And like... I just don't give a Like, I think I look rad. I think my face represents who I am. Uh, I like it. And so, that's basically the end of the road. Girl, you have everyone in the choir singing amen, but I think a lot of women go through their life this morning, they put on extra moisturizer. They got offended if someone didn't look them, you know, didn't, I don't know, maybe make a comment or whatever. But I feel like we're all trying to live the life you're describing. But when reality hits and mm. you feel like, why didn't I get promoted or why did I get overlooked? Sometimes we think it's because of our looks. That's interesting that you put it that way because uh, I think oftentimes uh, if, we, if we want something to change in our world, We'd, ra we'd like the reason to be something we feel like we have control over, mm. which is like, this is the way anorexics think too. If only I, if I lose 15 pounds or get down to X number, you know, anyway, mm -hmm. then, then everything around, else around me will change. Mm. That's not how life works. Yeah. Like good things are coming your way whether, whether you change your face or not. So like, what are you doing? What are you trying to, anyway, it's all about yeah. fear. Yeah. The other thing you talk about, which I think is so true, and, and I, I try to think about this, is like we have one life. Mm -hmm. We don't have that long here. And mm -hmm. if you're spending, uh, and you know, I, and I think we can all say, I know that I've spent time beating myself up or mm -hmm. feeling bad about something that is not even in my control. Mm -hmm. If you're spending half your time worried about the way you look, mm -hmm. it's like, what else are you not doing? Mm -hmm. I know. It t it's taking up a lot of time. Did, um, you, ever, did you ever think like, Worry no, about the way you looked or anything? Well, I definitely, I mean, uh, 
criticisms of my yeah. face definitely pushed a button in me that didn't have anything to do with my face. So in my first book, Fame, there's a chapter called Acid that goes into like how I process that out and what it was really about. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about this, it was mm -hmm. about something else. Um, and that prompted, and once I got on the other side of that, then, then I wrote the book, because I wanted to look at like in society, like where do we even get the idea that women's faces are broken and have to be fixed? Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's psychotic. Yeah. The idea is psychotic and it's, and I think the suggested solutions are barbaric. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is not to say anybody who's already done anything to them, fine. Again, mm -hmm. forget your face. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Forget it. Yeah. But take the opportunity to get at the fear that if you if it, you did it because it was a there was a fear in you, then just get rid of that that's fear. Button, yeah, that's though. interesting. That's the button. That's, so you're talking about the fear. So if you were going to try to let someone know what the fear is, what's something you can say or how do you figure it out? Exactly. Well, for afraid? me, it's like. Uh, for me, it was, uh, I'm afraid if people think I look old, then therefore, and I had a therefore. They had nothing to do with my face. Right. And for someone, it might be they're afraid that they're never going to get a mate, or they're afraid their mate will leave them, or they're afraid that uh, they won't get a job, or they'll lose the job they've got, or that people aren't going to listen to them anymore, something right. like that. Something like that, yeah. And I'm saying that fear was already in you before your face. That wasn't changed. about your, yeah, that wasn't it about was, how you It has nothing to do with... So you were already afraid of that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. go deal with that. Like journal that. Go to a therapist. Like but what whatever. About the practical sense that some people do not get jobs. Sometimes you do age out of things, or they say, yeah. But maybe, maybe you aged out of that job, but they don't want to hire you because you're so experienced. They know they're going to have to pay you. Yeah, uh -huh. totally. So right. they'd so rather hire somebody totally. young. So it's not about who can aging have an out. Entry level a, salary. Totally. Right. You know what I mean? There are other. How you look at it. And also. You probably have another opportunity coming your way. Mm -hmm. You need to be out of this so you're available for this other thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and to me, in life, you always trade up. There's always something better. And even if it's like a, a fallow time where mm -hmm. there's not a lot going on, mm -hmm. there's something in that. There's something happening. You're never not moving up in your life, mm -hmm. no matter what the situation is. Mm -hmm. You just got to look at, like, Get a different perspective on yeah. it because something cool is happening in your something life. Something cool, yeah. Can, really quickly, kids, social media, yeah. girls. We have young, yes. young girls. I, this is what I'd say to girls. It's, I can't cuss on here, <laughs> but it's an effing lie. Yeah. It's a lie that there's something wrong with your face. There's nothing wrong with your mm -hmm. face. Don't let it distract you from all the things that are coming your way. Totally. Right, your purpose. Totally. Don't yeah. let it distract you from your track. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with your face. So now that that's solved, now what are you doing in your but life? With like with social said, media like, and waste. all of that. Well, then get, stop yeah, get off of social it. media so Yeah, don't much. compare. Yeah. It's not real. Yeah. Right. Social right. media isn't real. Yeah. That's really so true. That it, you can live yes. here or you yeah, can yeah, live. Yeah. You can live like, totally. I'm not on social media right now. Yeah. I mean, look what we're yeah, doing, doing here. Or travel. Yeah. yeah. Or you'll never have... Fewer responsibilities. Young people will never have yeah. fewer yes, responsibilities so than they've got right now. Yeah. Go travel. Right. Go learn a language. Go, you know, Sing. take a cooking class. Yeah, I mean, totally. what, so, you know, like yeah. instead of worrying about the way yeah. we look all the yeah. time. Yeah. And stop. And you're here for this long, and nobody's going to remember you, which is a freedom. Nobody's going to remember me, so I don't have to defend a brand mm. that's going to live on after me. Forget it. What am I? I'm gonna waste my time defending something that's never gonna. Here's here's an example. You go down Hollywood Boulevard and you got all these stars in the sidewalk, right? Now I'm in the business, so I should know all these people, right? <laughs> now at some point these people were famous enough to get a star yeah. or had enough money to buy one. Okay, that's a whole other thing, right? Because the people know, right? You just yeah, we know them. that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know two thirds of these people. Right. So. No one's going to remember you, so enjoy your life. Stop defending a brand that's not going to live past you. Oh, my thank gosh. Thank you. Steve. That was good. We feel free. Yes. Thank you. Thank that was you, good. Justine. All right. Thank you so much. Coming up. And we, we, now we love that you work here yeah. now. Coming up, two of New York City's brightest stars, Leslie Odom Jr. and Nicolette Robinson. Yeah, they got a new project. Can't wait to talk about Coming up right after this.
Ashley Odom Jr. and Nicolette Robinson are an entertainment powerhouse couple, and they know how to slay on the red carpet, too. He is known for his Aww. Tony and Grammy winning performance in Hamilton. Yes, and she has made history as the first black woman to take on the leading role mm. in the Broadway show Waitress. Now, this couple, who are parents of two small kids, have written a children's book called I Love You More Than You'll Ever no. I mean, the title alone makes me oh. want to cry. Oh. I love it's this. So beautiful. And we want to get to this because you all are beautiful parents. But to start off, you've got to be a beautiful couple. Yeah. And the love story between you guys is pretty amazing. How long have you guys been together? 14 years. 14 years? Yeah, Married yeah. 10. Married yeah. 10. And you celebrated with renewing your vows? We did. Um, we, in December, we had a, a vow renewal with some of our closest friends and family and marked the time, celebrated surviving, yeah. <laughs> you know? Wait, it was beautiful. What, yeah. Do you remember what it was about each other when y'all first yeah. met that yeah. interested you, that made you feel like there mm -hmm. was something there? I was not I was not at all hypnotized by by her <laughs> physical beauty. I, I really I was able to look past that uh, and, and to her heart. I mean, you know, Nicolette glows from the inside. Yeah, she you does. know, if she if she if she was not beautiful inside, she wouldn't be as beautiful outside. So uh, it was it was yeah. That, and her kindness, really, you know, mm -hmm. her kindness Aww. like uh, you often choose, you know, somebody with qualities that you wish you had. Mm -hmm. And that kindness, I knew I needed, I needed a little <laughs> bit more of that in my life. Yeah. It was, it was, for me, it was just a soul connection. I just, I just knew that I loved this human being. I just wanted to be around him all the time. Oh. And then it grew from there. Well, it I, helps that he's handsome. Well, I was gonna say, <laughs> and you guys too, I mean, do y'all sing together? I just picture y'all, since you're both Broadway people, do you ever get together and just hang out in the we house? Do. And... We do, we, we jam a little bit. It, yeah. this, the book is actually we uh, music and reading is you know huge in our house and yeah. so the book is actually a, a song too. Uh, we recorded a, we we wrote the mm. text of the book as lyrics to a song and you know the you can find it on YouTube and listen to the song as you read the book or vice or versa. It's so beautiful. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a it's a lullaby and a, this book is a love story to your two children. Mm -hmm. It's kind of based on your nighttime routine with yeah, them. Right. Yeah. We have young we children. All, we all yeah, have young yeah, children. Yeah. Yeah. What is what is life like in the evenings at y'all's home? Well, bedtime is such a huge ritual in our household and anytime we're both home, we try to both be present for bedtime mm -hmm. at the same time and so we read book together, we sing and we say prayer and we, we just try to end the night leaving the kids feeling really warm and comforted and loved and so yeah that was kind of the inspiration to, to the text for us we wanted to bring that into the children's so book world. Sometimes you write a beautiful book like you did and then you read it to your kids and you wonder, like, I've written a children's book and my kids are like, okay, can we have the other one? I'm like, but yeah, this yeah. is ours, you yeah. wrote but, it. But, 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 what did your children <laughs> think when you first, when they first saw the book and you were reading it to them? Oh, they, I mean, you know, you can see those, those are, uh, Joy it. Huang Ruiz, Beautiful. our illustrator, oh, kind of she incorporated these Drink personal light. touches. It's not all about us. You know, we wanted it yeah. to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. We didn't want it to be solely a letter, a love yeah. letter to uh, Abel and, and Lucy. But uh, mm -hmm. the pictures of our family oh. uh, did influence uh, the drawings. And so, yeah, that, oh they gosh. loved that, the Look little personal that. touches of Lucy's favorite teddy bear and Abel's favorite passy. Yeah. yeah. Little, little. Yeah, they loved eggs. seeing yeah. little, yeah, little bits yeah. that. Yeah. You them. all said that there's a little bit of a song to this. Yes. Yeah. Will y'all sing a little, a little bit to us? Bit. Will you put oh. us to sleep? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Sure. Uh, he, he's got the perfect pitch. I, two, three. I love you more than you'll ever know. You take my hand and then off we go. Day by day. Day by day as I watch you grow. I love you more than you'll ever know. Oh, I love you so. <laughs> okay, we're crying. No. That is so, so beautiful. Oh, my God. Sing together. Oh, my God. Kids are so lucky. Oh, my God. That was really beautiful. Okay, what happened to us? Help we us. need that for our kids. Yes, we do. All right. Okay. All right. So we're going to download to that. that song, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll go song. to YouTube. And yeah. What's it called again? The song. I love you more than you'll ever know. And the book, yeah. too. You guys get this get it. book. All right. It for is more a on book. Leslie and Nicolette's book, uh, I'll love you more than you'll ever know, you can go to today.com. I mean, book. come on. The book so has its good. own song. <laughs> so good. Okay, coming up, grab oh. your pink jackets. The cast of the new show, Grease, Rise of the Pink Ladies. They're here. We're going to talk with them after this. Okay, that was
There's show-stopping original music, there's classic 50s fashion, and of course, there's some high school drama. We are talking about the brand new series, Grease, Rise of the Pink Ladies. We've been so looking forward to this. The story takes place four years before the original blockbuster film, so let's take a sneak peek. Everyone already thinks we're such bad girls. We're not girls, we're ladies. <laughs> the Pink Ladies. Fine. I'll consider it. On a trial basis. <laughs> so, Jane, you think a pink lady can become president? I spent so much time just trying to prove that I'm the good guy and Buddy's the bad guy. But I'm realizing that maybe sometimes you gotta be bad to do good. Yeah. Gotta be bad to do good. Oh, Four of the stars gosh. are with us now. Marissa Davila, Cheyenne Isabel Wells, Ari... No Tartamasa. Thank no you! No Tartamasa! <laughs> and Trishu. Yes. <laughs> Ladies, first of all, this is amazing. I'm so happy that you're all here with us today. This has been a life changer. Certain things in life happen and your life changes. Will you explain like how this has changed the course of your life? I mean, it already has. Yeah. We've just gone through the ringer yeah. of all of the, the, the filming process and the press process. It's like no other. I don't, I don't think anyone could have prepared us for something like this, but I'm just really glad that I have them to do it right now. How did you, how does a role like this come about? I mean, all of you have been musical theater kids right. since you were very young, have probably given your heart and soul yeah. to this. But how do you get a call like this? Like, yeah. how did you even get the audition? Yeah. Uh, I, got an, I got a random email yeah. in the audition with a couple emails that day. Okay. Yeah, just random email. Random, <laughs> random email <laughs> from the agents. Oh. Yeah, from the, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I was actually working an immersive um, theater show in downtown LA, and one of our cast members was like, hey, there's this open call, everybody should submit. So I reached out to my and reps. I'm like, hey, can we can we submit to this? An yeah. open call. It was a nation. Yeah. 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 So yeah. out of how many how many people were, were auditioning? Do you know? Uh, hundreds? Hundreds. Who knows? Yeah. Hundreds. Who knows? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. More. Okay. It's probably a lot. So the whole <laughs> this is a call you don't forget. When you get the call that you have been selected. It has to be mind blowing. Ari, what was it like for you? Well, for, they they tried to trick us. They really they did. To they told us that it was another audition. We had already done our screen test. We all were like waiting for, to hear something, and they're like, "We have to bring you back on." Um, and we were in the waiting. I was in the waiting room, just like, kind of like, "What are we doing? Like, we have <laughs> there's no more what scenes. Is like, what is this?" And then they surprised us, and it was the all the the everyone from exactly. Paramount, the execs, and the oh three, my the gosh, team. that must have been a like. You it must have felt like a life-changing yeah. day. Oh, yeah. Trisha, I heard that you taped your parents when this happened. Do we have a little bit of this? I know they're here. Let's look. <laughs> so you just told them? Okay, so. Yeah, I oh. talk about life changing. I definitely felt like my life was about to change and this would never happen again. And I wanted to capture that moment, oh. even though they don't like being on camera. So <laughs> well, sorry, they don't sorry, like to be on camera, all. but they're here. So <laughs> can we just say hi? <laughs> and we have, with, uh, they're your yeah. 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 Who else do we have? Who else is here? Let's see. Who, who else? else is with us? Span out a little, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Some of your family. Oh, oh my friends. gosh. This is such. A, now, did you guys all see Grease 1? 
Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, what, you, wasn't it like the type of thing that you watched over and over and over yeah, again? Over and over yeah. So yeah. does anybody remember their favorite part or favorite line? Oh. oh, I love when the pink ladies are walking in a school and yeah, they're like, totally. we're going to rule the school. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So oh. cool. What else do any of y'all oh have gosh. memorable? Men of rats. Men of fleas on rats. Yeah. The worst than fleas on rats. Yeah, names on fleas on rats. <laughs> oh I really like that. Don't make me laugh. <laughs> My are you all just friends? I can tell. Yeah. Were you friends from oh, the beginning? Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't know each other before no. this. Yeah, we but... actually met during a fire alarm at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. 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 And then it, like, it seems like chemistry hit right yes. away. It so, did. Like, I never got yeah. to go to Whistler a lot. Yeah. Well, just well, one, one time. Just one time. One time. Yeah. Well, one time. One time. I promise I was there, too. One time. <laughs> one time in Whistler. We're going to yes. do another all show. Right. Don't go anywhere, all right? Because it's time for some friendly competition. Oh, are y'all ready? Yes. I'm ready. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm we're ready tackling some Grease trivia coming up right after this. the new series, Grease, The Rise of the Pink Ladies. We've got Marissa, Trisha, Ari, and Cheyenne. We are so excited. Yeah, and uh, we like a little friendly competition. Uh, so wait, do we have some special jackets? We brought pink lady jackets. You did? What? You're become an honorary pink, pink lady. lady. Okay. And as I put on this jacket, I'm going to confess something right now that I have never said out loud. What? You're I've gonna, never seen. I have Get out. never seen Grease. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, oh we're my goodness. I'm going to I've seen Grease 244 <laughs> times, so I don't so, know who has the advantage. Okay, wait, we're not going to lose. I have confidence. We also have some. We have a secret backup person who's going to help us. Yes. Okay. Wait, what? A secret yeah, backup person? We do. That's not yeah. 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 yeah, we do. Yes. Go ahead. Weapons. Well, Grease is so infused into pop culture, so I think you guys will be fine. Here's how it works. We separated you into two teams because you're so competitive. So here's how it's going to go. Uh, Hoda is joined by Marissa and Trisha, and on Team Jenna, we have Ari and Cheyenne. One by one, you'll step up to face each other off in Greece inspired pop trivia. So you will have to hit the buzzer, and then if you answer incorrectly, this team gets to um, steal. Steal and we so on and so forth. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Oh, okay, Hoda, and, it's you and I. Who will be the best? All right. Wait, so it's one at a time? Yeah. Got this. So Hoda and okay. Jenna, you're first? Okay. okay. Name this song written in emojis. What? Oh, wait, I can't. Lipstick, stack of books, water drop. I know, Beauty School Dropout. Yes. <laughs> yes. Beauty School Dropout. Those it. emojis were tiny. Okay, they're, question they're, two, they're, Marissa they're, versus Ari. Are you oh ready? Okay, okay watch this. Finish the Ari, lyrics to this it. song. I apologize for my voice. I got chills, they're multiplying, and I'm losing control, because the power. Get it, girl. Yes. You're supplying. Yes. Is it like you're supplying? just mentioned that they waited until the end. Yeah, we did. Oh, yeah, well, you oh. both did. <laughs> we both did. You both did. You know, it's okay. It's, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's it's okay. okay. It's okay. 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 <laughs> question three. Trisha versus Cheyenne. Come on, Lacey. What is the name of this dance move? Oh, here. You have to look at me. Okay. Oh. Watch. Watch Wait, Dawn. Oh, watch oh. Dawn. Oh, you know. No. Did I get it? Did I get yeah, it? Yeah. What is it? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Fill in the blank to Sandy's famous line. Tell me about it. It's done. Yep. What is, this is multiple choice. What is, oh, uh, no, 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 we finish your question. No, we get to steal no, now because. No, 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 I, no, I didn't say at first that you have to wait. Yeah, that's go true. ahead. But what is Rizzo's first name? <laughs> A, Sally, B, Betty, C, Jenny. B, Betty. Yes, well, I would not know that. You could hit okay, it first every time. Okay, that's, that's true, that's true, that's true. <laughs> We're okay, so this one, so whoever buzzes in first. Ready? Oh, okay, it's a tie, it's a tie. Okay, so it's Trisha. Three to two. Oh, oh just no, kidding. Sorry. Three to two. You, you have, have to finish the question because otherwise you could buzz contract. it right now. Okay, okay Trisha okay. versus Cheyenne. Okay, finish the question. Finish the okay question. so finish the lyrics to this song, but wait for me to end. <laughs> Summer loving had me a blast. Summer loving happened so fast. I met a girl. <sighs> Crazy for me. Yes! Oh, oh, I met a yes. boy. Cute as can be. That was the one. It's me and you. Oh, it's yes. with you. No, it's no, this isn't anyone. No, this isn't anyone. No, wait, wait, wait. As the host, did you just go? Oh, as the host, this is anyone. Anyone on the team. 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 Congratulations. Yeah. This Congratulations. is so much fun, guys. And to your families who are here. We Coming up, y'all, we have a performance by American yes, I am. right after this. The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. These guys are always having the best day of their lives, the, uh, Amer the band American Authors. And now their nights are looking pretty good, too. Their new album, Best Night of My Life, is a follow-up to their mega hit, We've Been Singing It All Morning, that came out almost a decade ago. I know. Oh, my gosh. Woo. How has it been a decade? Yeah. I don't know. Where does the time go, right? <laughs> but this is such a fun follow-up, and I, and I read that you guys wanted to make sure you kept that kind of beautiful spirit. Yeah, we really did. We wanted to keep the energy going. And, you know, why not take the party from the day into the night? Am I right? Yes. Well, and that Come song, on. by the way, hit, hit a chord with so many people. We can't wait to hear this next one. So this one is called... Best, Best night. night of my life. Let's oh, have God. it. Hey. hey. Thank you.
Get ready yes. to go out, putting makeup yeah. on, having a cocktail. Turning it up. Yes. Oh, my God. Y'all talked to awesome. awesome. Okay, American Authors, new album, Best Night in My Life. It is available now. Y'all download it. Good mood, everybody. Woo. We'll be back right after this. Ben and Jerry's free cone day is today from noon to 8 p.m. Noon to 8? You get one. Get in line. You get a uh -huh. cone. Y'all, tomorrow, Brooke Shields is here. Mm, yummy. You want a little bite, Brooke? I mean, I was almost going to wear a yellow dress. That would have been a lot of turmeric. Uh -huh. That would have been cute. We would have really, like, <laughs> we would have been, like, real turmeric champions. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen.
Turmeric, or Haldi in Hindi or Urdu, is prized for its golden yellow hue and the warm, earthy aroma it imparts to a variety of recipes. It has a rich history in South Asian cuisine and culture, and it's always been a fixture in my own home. Recently, many in the wellness community have also touted turmeric's potential health benefits, often labeling it as a superfood. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about one of my favorite spices. Are there any proven medicinal uses? Whether it's in root form, ground, or dried, how do you keep it fresh? I can't wait to share a comforting dish with turmeric that always transports me back to my mom's kitchen. But first, I want to get to the root of it all, literally. So I'm off to a farm growing turmeric in a surprising place, upstate New York. Growing up, turmeric added beautiful color and wonderful flavor to almost all of the dishes my mom cooked, from her masala veggies to her haldi rice. But she only used it in its dry ground form. I wanted to see just how my family's favorite spice is farmed, and I didn't have to fly all the way to India. Am I giving me a little tour? Yeah, I'd love right, to, let's yeah. Start. About two hours north of New York City is Green Owl Farms in Rhinebeck. Suzanne Kelly converted her home to a working farm in 2013. Here, she grows potatoes, squash, and saffron. But her main crops are aromatics, namely garlic, ginger, and of course, turmeric. The turmeric plant kind of grows like a hand, then it will grow even more fingers right. off of that. Suzanne's love for agriculture began after college when she started growing vegetables. From graduate school in Florida to teaching at SUNY New Paltz, she never stopped gardening. What was your journey to getting to this point? I was an academic for a little over 10 years, yep, teaching women's gender and sexuality studies. And I was sort of longing to do something else. I had a big rambling garden, and I was thinking a lot about agriculture at that time. Yeah. I just sort of decided to take the leap. Suzanne's home sits on less than an acre, but after some extensive research, she realized she had enough land to turn it into a farm. How did you learn so much about all of this? It's mostly self-taught. Yeah. Just really following what, you know, what the experts have been doing, learning from other farmers. Oh, yeah, I never worked on a farm. Suzanne picked garlic, ginger, and turmeric as her main crops for strategic reasons. They can be grown without extra hands and don't need much space to yield enough to sell at farmer's markets. They can also easily be dried or ground up for sale during the winter. So give us a little explainer on turmeric. So turmeric is a rhizome that is traditionally used in uh, Southeast Asian, Middle Eastern, Indian cuisine. It's used as a spice. More people are probably familiar with it in its powder form that um, gets all ground up and dehydrated and then put in a jar and then we buy it in the spice rack of our supermarket. Turmeric is native to South Asia, specifically India, known for its warm tropical climate. So how do you grow turmeric in New York? I've been inspired by lots of other small farms that have been doing this in the Northeast for some time over the last, I don't know exactly when they started, but it's certainly over the last decade. I get my seed from um, from Hawaii. In Asia, there are more than 100 varieties of turmeric. Suzanne grows Indira yellow and Hawaiian red, which fare better in cooler places. You need at least 10 months to be able to grow it to full maturity, at which point it's how you find it in the grocery store, sort of with that hard, um, tough skin on the outside. Suzanne starts growing the delicate seeds in her climate-controlled basement in late February. I visited the farm in early summer to help Suzanne move the baby turmeric outdoors. This is a, about a hundred and I think 120 feet of um, a turmeric bed that we're going to plant. I'm ready. Okay. I've never been more ready. Turmeric, a rhizome, is closely related to ginger. Both have thick green stalks that grow upward above ground. The thick nodes and roots lie in the soil. The nodes, called rhizomes, are what we eat. So we're just going to Loosen the soil like that, and just stick it in like that, and that's it. Wow. We're gonna do a plant one about four to six inches apart. All right, so I'm gonna, gonna loosen, loosen it up a bit. Okay. A little deeper. Okay. All right, so going straight in? Yep, straight in. Have fun in there. You did it. Did you see that? Did you see that? Okay. Excellent. Good job. Good job. So do, am I you hired? really good. You are. I'm you hired. Are. You're okay. hired. Yep. I'm hired. Yep. I have a new yep. job. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> now you just need to do 200 more of them. Okay. Okay. Maybe cancel that. <laughs> May not have a new job.
By mid-October, the young turmeric is ready for harvest. So we pick it young. You're sort of hustling to get it harvest right. before the frost comes <laughs> because by November, by mid-November, you know, you might have snow, it's yeah. possible. With a short growing period before winter sets in, Suzanne picks the roots before the plant reaches full maturity. It has a kind of like fresh, young, kind of yellow, and in some cases red, depending upon the type, type of turmeric, kind of hue to it. Um, and the texture is a little bit different too. It's not as fibrous. It's more sort of like an apple when it's picked young. At the farmer's market where Suzanne sells her produce, she also hands out recipe cards to customers who may be unfamiliar with fresh turmeric. Suzanne, tell me a little bit about your customers' reactions when they see the turmeric. Well, the first reaction is, what is this? <laughs> yes, and then if they know what turmeric is, uh, they'll be like, oh yeah, I take that in a pill form. Right. Like this, a wellness this, angle. Like a wellness angle, yes, that really is about throwing it in your smoothie. Yeah, yeah and I think it's it's important to like educate right on that, on where it comes from. It's so interesting because I, I really have grown up around turmeric for as long as I can remember. Obviously very important in Indian cuisine and medicine and all of that, but I've never planted it. So it's so cool. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity to literally put oh, it into the soil. That's it's just, great. It's amazing to have that connection, right, between something that you eat and something that actually grows yeah. from the ground. In India, turmeric's importance runs much deeper than its culinary use. It's a huge part of many traditions and daily life. To learn more about its cultural legacy, I met up with Dr. Baswati Bhattacharya, an MD who also practices Ayurvedic medicine. Her book on Ayurveda details the history and methods used in the ancient holistic practice. What is Ayurveda? It is the longevity, which is Ayush or Ayu. So longevity and how to live well, and Veda, which is the science or the knowingness. The medicine of Ayurveda is that part of not just staying well and being healthy, but also the other side, which is when you're sick, when you're diseased, how to get well. Ayurveda is based on ancient writings that promote whole body wellness through diet, physical activity, and mindful practices. So those of us who practice Ayurvedic medicine focus more on the food as medicine, lifestyle medicine, and medicinal herbs, medicinal oils. But when you say, what is Ayurveda? Ayurveda is just a philosophy. It's not a religion, but it's a philosophy like organic living. We shared a meal at Divya's Kitchen in New York City. Divya chefs apply Ayurvedic principles to all of their recipes, and turmeric is used in many of their dishes. This looks so delicious. We've got a Kichdi classic, we've got a cashew curry, and we've got a mung bean soup. In the traditional practice, turmeric is considered anti-inflammatory. It's used to treat a variety of issues, including digestive problems, PMS symptoms, and arthritis pain. And so the golden sense of turmeric goes all the way from being an antimicrobial that protects the body to an anti-inflammatory, and this idea that it really enriches the body. 
Another use that is not a spice in cooking is what we now today call turmeric latte, which is taking <laughs> milk and putting a teaspoon of turmeric in it yeah. and using that as an anti-inflammatory before bed. Many Ayurvedic health claims are not supported by Western medical experts, but scientists at places like UCLA and John Hopkins are conducting more research. What is sort of that importance of turmeric in Indian culture? Um, it's part of the sacredness of honoring our bodies, yeah. honoring our minds, and it's something that comes from the ground and protects us. There's a lot of cultural aspects of this. So there's a gaye holud, which is where the bride and groom will have their own family members before marriage cover their whole bodies in turmeric and give them a bath in that. And there's variations of it in different cultures, but having that bath cleanses them, gets them ready. When we were kids, if we ever had a boo-boo, one of the prized things we could show our friends is that mom put some haldi on our boo-boo, right? Instead of a band-aid, you'd go and show that there was this big yellow stained spot. And so the golden sense of turmeric, it really enriches the body. In Ayurveda, turmeric's healing elements make it an essential spice for the whole body and even the mind. But I wanted to learn more about the latest medical research on its purported health benefits. Family in India uses turmeric in almost every dish for many reasons, in part because they see the spice as a preservative and antiseptic. But recently in the US, turmeric is being hyped as a health supplement. You can find it in pills, powders, and even beauty products. But what does the science really say about its benefits? To learn more about its many uses, I met with spice expert and cookbook author Kanchan Koya, who also happens to have a PhD in biomedicine from Harvard. I'm so excited to talk about all things turmeric with you, but I want to know a little bit more about you. I'm a scientist by training. My lab started to study the health benefits of turmeric in cancer. I had grown up in India where turmeric is just a part and parcel of the everyday and because I had grown up with it, I had kind of rolled my eyes at all the obsessions around it. And then here I was doing my PhD, my lab is studying turmeric and it was a real aha moment for me that a lot of this ancient kind of ancestral wisdom around these spices is bearing fruit when it comes to modern research and I was like, okay, maybe there's something to it. Conscience Lab studied the yellow pigment found in turmeric, curcumin. So curcumin is one of the compounds in turmeric that has been best studied 
and it's a polyphenol, which is just a certain kind of chemical compound that has effects in our bodies. Conscience Research found that curcumin aided in chemotherapy, making it more effective in treating cancerous cells in breast cancer patients. The reason I hesitate to sort of think of curcumin as a cure-all is because we don't have that many randomized clinical trials looking at the effects of curcumin in a whole human. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't have benefits in a whole human, it just means we need more data. Different brands of ground turmeric have vastly different levels of curcumin, but the actual amount of the polyphenol isn't required on food packaging or supplement labels, so it's impossible to know how much you're actually getting. While ground turmeric is readily available in most grocery stores today, the whole root has been growing in popularity as home cooks and wellness devotees learn more about the spice. When I was younger, I never cooked with it fresh, so I was excited to try it in a new way. We're going to be talking all about turmeric, and you're going to show me how to make a fresh turmeric tea. Never used fresh turmeric until I tried this tea when I was traveling in Vietnam. Fresh turmeric root isn't widely used in traditional Indian cooking, but it's a staple in Southeast Asian cuisine. So we're starting with fresh turmeric root, and this basically looks like ginger, but once you cut it down the middle, you will see it is very different. I think it looks really pretty, thinly sliced, so I'm just going to make some thin slices and rings. Are there any benefits to using fresh overground? So, you know, it's not a simple, um, this is better than that. I would say in a perfect world, you should incorporate both. Turmeric powder is rich in vitamin C and B6, plus it contains magnesium and iron. From a culinary perspective, they're very unique. The fresh um, has this sort of more vibrant, zesty kind of vibe, whereas the dry is definitely earthier, a little bit more bitter, and really amenable to adding to things like curries, soups, vegetables, whereas this is really nice in teas, broths, soups, and smoothies. Okay, so what are we adding in next? Okay, so next up we're going in with ginger. So next up is lemongrass, which I think just adds a really beautiful flavor and almost like a grassy note. Are we boiling this to the max? I like to boil the water, turn it off, and then add the turmeric and let it steep. And that's because I'm trying to preserve some of those essential oils that are really, really rich in the fresh turmeric. The turmeric tea needs about five minutes to steep. Our tea is hanging out, it's steeping, it's having a good time. I have so many questions for you about all things turmeric. So let's talk through all of these different varieties. There's actually so many. So here we have the Roma turmeric, which you can see is really, really vibrant orange. It's the one we used in our tea. Next, the yellow and mango varieties of turmeric both have a lighter color and a more delicate flavor. This is crazy, I've never seen this before. And it's a slightly different turmeric varietal. There's a lot of chefs, especially here in New York, that absolutely love blue turmeric because of this pine menthol flavor. Does it add color though? So I think um, it's very subtle, the color. Yeah. It's not as much, obviously, as the other ones. Whole dried turmeric root can be grated into dishes. It adds a unique brightness compared to the powdered spice. What are your tips for buying turmeric from the store? So my first tip is to buy it from a reputable spice brand and not from an open spice market. I love open spice markets, but we do have some disturbing evidence now that sometimes turmeric can be laced with heavy metals, specifically lead chromate to make it look more vibrant. Buy it where there is a clear package date and an expiration date so that you can at least know when it was packaged. So what about fresh turmeric? How do we store that? I would treat it just like you would ginger. So you would buy your fresh turmeric, put it in your fridge, maybe for like a week to 10 days. And if you want to store it longer, I would put it in the freezer. It's actually very easy to grate. A common cooking technique in Indian cuisine is blooming turmeric in hot oil and pairing it with black pepper. This helps bring out the flavor of both spices. So talk to me about the relationship between black pepper and curcumin. And is that a myth? Totally should be doing that. So curcumin, which is the main bioactive in turmeric, is obviously packed with benefits, but unfortunately isn't very well absorbed by the body. It's rapidly cleared by the liver. You really want to improve that bioavailability, as we call it, and you can do that by pairing it with black pepper. And that's because black pepper has a compound called piperin, which can reduce that clearance of the curcumin by the liver. In Western medicine, there have been few studies 
with limited participants, conducted about the interaction between ground turmeric and black pepper, but Conchin says the research looks promising. I've learned so much, and now I'm very excited to drink some tea. Is it ready? It's ready. It's been steeping for a good five to eight minutes, Yay. so we're ready to pour. Let's drink it. So this is almost ready to drink, and the okay. reason I say almost is because of the pepper point that we just covered. So if you really want to bring out those health benefits, especially from the turmeric, just a little dash of black pepper is Ooh. all you need. And finally, we want to add a little drop of a healthy fat, and that's because Pepper will improve the bioavailability of the curcumin, but so will a fat source. And I'm just going in with a very tiny drizzle of olive oil. Ooh. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Okay. Isn't it lovely? It's so vibrant and like zesty. It's but vibrant. But also not overwhelming at all. Right. I love learning how to make this. So thank you. Say turmeric. Turmeric. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to use turmeric in one of my favorite ways, kichdi. Kichdi goes by many names in India, from kichuri to kichuri to kejuri. Every region in the country has a unique version, but it's usually made with lentils, rice, and turmeric. And like any popular comfort food, every family has their own spin on the dish. My mom didn't really make a stew, but her combo of light and fluffy rice with lentils was always one of my favorite meals. Something that's really important to know when you're cooking lentils and rice is that it's really important to rinse and soak them before cooking. Rinsing helps get rid of any debris in the rice or the lentils, and then soaking them will allow it to cook faster. And now I'm just going to drain the water before I start cooking. I'm just going to add enough water to completely cover the rice and lentils so that we can cook it properly. This is roughly four to five cups of water, but I just want you to make sure that you're covering the rice and lentils completely. Now we're going to add turmeric, our star. We can't have kitchidi without it. It's going to add that nice golden color and it's delicious. So I'm going to cook the lentils and the rice until it's completely mushy. I want it to be really soft. The lentils cook for 30 to 35 minutes. While this is coming to a boil, I'm going to start prepping my veggies. The best part about kitchidi is that you can really sub in your favorite veggies. I'm using carrots, zucchini, and sweet potatoes, but green beans are also really nice here. You know, I really like to be a vegetable artiste. Uh, but you can cut your veggies however you want. My lentils and rice, they've come to a boil. I'm gonna move it to my back burner on a simmer, and then I'm gonna bring my steaming basket over here so I can start steaming my veggies. I let the veggies steam for about 10 minutes until fork tender. Time to chop up my aromatics. First, a rough dice for my onion. Then, just peel and grate fragrant ginger. My veggies are done, I'm going to move them to my stove top and then get to work on sautéing my aromatics. Now that my pan is hot, I'm going to go ahead and add my coconut oil. Once the oil starts to shimmer, I'm going to go ahead and add my cumin seeds. I'm adding whole cumin seeds to the oil to allow the cumin seeds to bloom, extract that delicious flavor. 
but you know it's ready when the cumin seed starts to sizzle and bubble. You only want this to go for about 15 to 30 seconds. You don't want the oil to burn. Then you're gonna go ahead and add your onions. That's the sound we like. We're cooking these onions on medium heat until they're tender and translucent about three to four minutes. And now I'm gonna go ahead and add my grated ginger. I'm gonna cook this for a couple minutes with the ginger. We're gonna add some salt and pepper. I gotta clean my workstation so we can assemble our kitcheny and take this off the heat. Check out the rice and lentils. <gasps> now is the time where everyone becomes friends White shirt, risky. <laughs> I'm gonna turn my stove on, cook the lentils and rice with the onions for about two to three minutes, and then I'll go ahead and add my veggies, cook everything together, and then we'll be done. I'm ready to serve myself a bowl of kishi. I've been waiting for this moment for a very long time. I finished my kitchity with some fresh cilantro and freshly ground black pepper. Take a quick picture, send it to my mom who I hope will be very proud of me. I think I got the shot. Now I get to eat. The best part, obviously. Oh, so good. Cheers. It's so good. It's very nostalgic for me too. What else can I say? It's cute, it's comforting, it's kitschy. That should go on a shirt. I have a bit of a kitcheny lunch date. I'm gonna be joined by nutritionist Sarika Shah, who's gonna to talk to me about all things turmeric and kitcheny. Can't wait. Sarika, it's so nice to meet you. I have been very excited about our kitcheny date. I just made some. Um, can you talk to me first about your family's kitcheny recipe? Because I know, you know, depending on where you're from in India, everyone makes it a little bit different. I use my mom's recipe. Um, it's a one-to-one -one dal and basmati rice ratio. But something slightly different my mom does is adds um, spinach to it. Sarika Shah, AKA the Indian nutritionist on Instagram, is a registered dietitian. She's been practicing for more than 20 years. Her goal is to teach Indian Americans how to eat traditional dishes in a healthier way. She also happens to know a lot about turmeric. What are the nutritional benefits of turmeric that have maybe actually been backed up by science? Are there any? So um, science is still studying turmeric, but turmeric claims to treat skin disorders, upper respiratory infections, any ache and pain essentially. Um, and that comes from Ayurvedic medicine. So does science back it up? There's limited studies, subjects of 40 to about 120, but I have seen studies with a thousand, but that's really not enough to give me the science backing to say, yes, this is exactly what it proves and this is what it does. But the studies are positive, so I think there should be more studies done. So with that being said, do you include turmeric as an element of your recommendations for clients at all? Um, no. Turmeric as a capsule or curcumin, which is the compound out of turmeric that is also glorified. So I don't recommend that. I'm very cautious about that because FDA regulations are not stringent on supplements. Is it laced with lead? Is it have other products in it? So um, if you want to include turmeric, the only way I will ever tell people is included in your food in the powder form. So tell me about how you feel about Indian food and turmeric as well coming to the forefront of food and culture. Especially in the US, that Indian food is coming up to the forefront, that it's being appreciated as healthier food, um, as something good. And I think that's great for the generations growing up. When I grew up, I would never bring Indian food to lunch. I wouldn't be caught dead with that. Um, <laughs> because the smell or the color or people staring at me, but if it's now something that they claim as like a lentil soup, which is actually our dal with rice, no one's gonna bat eyelashes at it. I think it's when we glamorize it and we try to make large doses of it and make it something bigger than it really is, is where the risk comes in. But if we take it for as it is and the way we've used it for thousands of years in our culture, I think it's perfect and it's great. Turmeric is definitely the golden child of spices. Its warming aroma and Ayurvedic properties have been staples in India for centuries. As more research is conducted on its health benefits, there's no doubt that this spice's popularity will continue to rise. 
but turmeric's cultural significance should never be ignored. You see this? See this pizza? You wanna eat this pizza? Too bad, I'm going to. <laughs> I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Who doesn't just love ooey, gooey, and totally decadent cheese? I know you do. Americans truly can't get enough. In fact, we've tripled our cheese consumption since the 70s. Today, the average person here eats a whopping 35 pounds of cheese a year. 35! So it's no surprise that cheese is usually one of the toughest things to give up if you're ditching dairy. But I've got some good news for you. These days, there are a lot of tasty options out there when it comes to vegan cheese. And I'm determined to explore them all. Well, maybe not all, but I've discovered a few really, really good ones. I'm checking out a new type of pizza shop serving up killer pies. Then, I'll be using cashews to make an irresistible dairy-free dip of my own. But first, I'm headed to Riverdale, an artisanal cheese shop making its mark on the plant-based cheese world. Michaela Grobe is the owner and cheesemonger of Riverdale, a vegan cheese shop on Manhattan's Lower East Side. It's the only shop in New York City that exclusively features dairy-free artisanal cheeses. Michaela, thank you for having me. I love a plant-based cheese moment. This is very exciting for me. Tell me about what inspired you to start Riverdale. Basically, I love cheese. Um, I love animals. I became vegan for 40 animals, basically. And when I then started looking around for cheese, I found that you know, it was, it was out there, but you couldn't really access it easily. Michaela's quest for better vegan cheese started a decade ago, when it was still really hard to find dairy-free cheese that was actually good. While working a high-profile job in the corporate world, Michaela saw an opportunity to open a new type of store. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if there would be one place, just like any other tea shop, where everything's vegan? And that's kind of where the idea came from. She began reading books on vegan cheesemaking and took classes with acclaimed vegan chefs. On the weekends, Michaela went through a lot of trial and error in her home kitchen, while also crafting a plan to start her own food business. I still had my corporate job, and at one point I was like, okay, I think it's time for me to leave the corporate world and really do something about it. I really thought, I wanna, I wanna try it. If, it. if it fails, it fails, right? But at least I tried it. With enough money saved, she left her job in 2015 and opened Riverdale, named after her two pets, a dog named River and her cat, Fidel. But Michaela's mission to make vegan cheese more accessible wasn't just a passion project. It was a pivotal time for a booming business. In 2017, vegan cheese sales hovered around $294 million. By 2022, that figure is projected to reach nearly 600 million. That's a 100% increase. Are you trying to mimic, you know, dairy cheese, or are you kind of creating something in your own line, in your own world, yeah. um, or are you just trying to replicate the experience of buying cheese? Yeah. It's a little bit of, of everything. It's the experience. It's a product that people know, uh, that looks like a brie, that looks like a, a gouda. But then there are also other cheeses that have no equivalent in the dairy world. Riverdale's blue cheese uses the same fungus that creates the iconic navy marbling in the dairy version. But the shop's Vitopian is a cashew and soy-based cheese with a unique texture that's semi-firm yet creamy. The way I like to explain our customers is to not look for like for like um, imitation. It's the same as if you would make a a gouda from a cow's milk and from a goat's milk. It has the same techniques, the same cultures, but the end product is very different. So it's the same if your base is a cashew nut. The end product's different, but it's still a cheese, in my, my view at least. Who do you want to be eating this cheese? I mean, definitely have a lot of vegan customers, but we also have people that are vegetarian, um, lactose intolerant. So whereas we 
do obviously speak to the vegan community. Um, for me, it was also important that we reach out and connect with the non-vegan community. You're targeting the cheese curious. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that it's difficult to make the switch because people are afraid of like, oh my God, what am I gonna eat? Michaela has the cheesy answer to that question. In the shop's kitchen, she showed me how to make a few of her handcrafted cheeses. Okay, Michaela, what are we making today? So we're actually making a feta today. It's going to be a very salty and crumbly and firm one, which is perfect for salads. Vegan cheesemongers use a variety of ingredients to mimic the taste and texture of dairy cheese. Common bases include a combo of nuts, vegetable oils, and soy products. So for this one, we're actually using tofu. This tofu has been frozen first, and then we kind of squeeze out all the liquid so it becomes very dry. Michaela uses firm tofu to create a sturdy feta. It allows the cheese to uniformly slice and dice, but also crumble, just like the traditional Greek cheese. For flavor, Michaela adds Himalayan salt, red wine vinegar, garlic powder, and Greek oregano. Then there are two types of fats. So you're using coconut oil here. Why are mm -hmm. you using coconut and not a different kind of oil or fat? Yeah, I mean, coconut oil um, firms up once it's chilled, mm -hmm. so it really helps with just making the cheese firmer. All right, so I've got some olive oil here. Mm -hmm. And it's just olive oil with a little bit of oregano in it, and that's just to get a little bit more flavor. And I'm just using a, like a, a tablespoon or something like that. Okay, so we're ready to blend our feta. Mm -hmm. Everyone's gonna become friends in here. Mm -hmm. What are we yeah. looking for for it to be done, and how long are we processing for? So we're looking for a very smooth, almost shiny kind of consistency. Even when I think it's done, I usually like to give it another minute or two just to be on the, uh, on the safe side. You can't over blend this. Michaela scrapes down the processor every minute or so to ensure the mixture reaches a smooth, creamy consistency. Then it's transferred into cheese molds. We made two flavors, one plain and one with an olive tapenade center. The cheeses sit in the fridge for two days to firm up. I made some ahead already, oh, so we don't have to wait overnight and we can taste them right away. Oh, exciting. So this is what it looks like when you turn it upside down. What? So this is one with the um, tapenade layer, oh. and here is one with uh, sun-dried tomatoes. Wait, this is crazy how firm it is. Yeah. Can we eat them? Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Will you have some with me? I want to so, try this one. Yeah, you wait. try that one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mmm. Mm. So it's nice and salty. Wow, that's crazy. Crumbly, but it doesn't taste anything like the, uh, the, the tofu that we use as a base. It feels very light, but still like dense enough to mm -hmm. feel like, oh wow, like I'm eating something that could really stand up to a dairy yeah. cheese. Yeah. This is so delicious. My mind is blown. You have so many different types of cheeses. Can we try some mm. other ones too? Oh, absolutely.
At Riverdale, a vegan cheese shop in New York City, owner Michaela Grobe makes two cheeses in-house. She also imports over a dozen varieties from across the country and around the world. I'm genuinely freaking out because this all looks like real cheese. <laughs> like, talk to me about what we're seeing here. So this one is another one of our house-made cheeses. It's, it's, a, it's a blue cheese type and it's aged for about well, two to three months. It's definitely more on the funkier side. The uh, base ingredient here is cashews. Then we have a brie style here. The cultures that are being used for to create this nice fluffy rind mm. is the same as you would use on a dairy application. This one's uh, from Texas and it actually has um, cashews and rice flour. Oh, what kind of cheese is this? So that's a smoky aged cheddar style, very nice and firm and very strong and uh, deep flavor. And here we have one that's made in New York and it's made from macadamia nuts and hemp. Mm. And it has a little bit, little bit of a kick, a little bit of a spice, something like along the lines of a pepper jack. I'm very excited to try them. How are we gonna assemble it? Can we make like a little cute cheese platter or something Oh yeah, like absolutely. We have a few things that will go really nicely with each of those cheeses. Nice. Riverdale also carries many cheese board essentials, including crackers, jams, and vegan charcuterie. I would Absolutely. have a party just to serve this. It was almost time to dive in, but you already know, my camera always eats first. I think I have to start with the pepper jack because yeah, I love you should. spice. Absolutely. So it is a bit spicy. I'm okay. Yeah, especially the I'm, crust is, is gonna be spicy. I'm ready for it. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Once I get started, I just can't stop. Vegan blue with strawberries, anyone? Cheers. Cheers. Oh my God, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. And we had to pair the brie with pear. Michaela, you have changed my world today. This is so <laughs> exciting. Um, Great. And I just can't thank you enough. This is incredible. And I, I hope people really see all the amazing things you're doing with vegan cheese. I'm really happy to have so many more cheese makers. We find so many more cheese makers like every month. There's a new one we start working with. Thank you so much. If you ever need more tasters, I'll be sure to just like yes. hit me up. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll be here. <laughs> I've saved a little room for my next cheesy stop. A New York pizza shop firing up plant-based pies for their screaming fans. <laughs>
I live in Brooklyn and there are few foods that scream New York City more than pizza. But is pizza really pizza without cheese? Vegan cheeses may be delicious, but capturing the melty, gooey goodness of mozzarella is tough. And that's obviously essential for a perfect pie. Meet one of my favorite vegan pizza spots, Screamers. Come on. Are you kidding? Is it a joke? It's not a joke, it's vegan. <laughs> Open since 2016, Screamers is similar to many iconic slice spots all over the city. Head chef Joy Strang has worked at Screamers for four years. She developed popular pies on the menu, like the Truffle Scream, a pizza covered in oyster and cremini mushrooms, plant-based parm, arugula, and a drizzle of fragrant truffle oil. Tell me about the inspiration behind Screamers. I mean, the inspiration was literally just that. It was a bunch of vegans sitting around wanting to um, have a really good slice of New York pizza, and thus Screamers was born, you know? What was your background before Screamers? Uh, so I spent a lot of time as a chef for a Mexican restaurant, and I've also worked in American fine dining. But I also find that like, cooking vegan food, you just take the same methods that you use for cooking anything and just apply it to vegan ingredients. Screamer serves all types of pies, from classics like pepperoni and a fully loaded supreme, to mashup flavors, like a Reuben pie topped with spiced seitan and Thousand Island dressing. They have two locations in Brooklyn and a dedicated following on social media. How far has somebody traveled to get some Screamers pizza? We get people from all over. Brazil um, is notable, uh, Germany. And I always feel badly for people that are traveling from out of town when they come here because then they eat the pizza and then they have to think about the pizza when they go home. And <laughs> I'm like, I'm really sorry for They enough. ruin people. Yeah. What do you say, Joy, to people who are skeptical of vegan cheese? Because obviously cheese is a huge part of pizza. I'd say, honestly, that's probably our number one challenge is people come in and they're like, oh, I don't know about the cheese, but vegan cheese has come a long way. You know, um, before there weren't as many options, but I think there's so much more focus and emphasis on making things more delicious these days as opposed to just having a alternative. Screamers uses a specific vegan cheese to replicate the texture of dairy cheese. So we use a uh, BioLife mozzarella. Oh, nice. Yeah. So we've tried many, many cheeses, but this seems to be the one with the best smell, the best, best mouthfeel, I think. What is it made out of? Coconut oil and potato starch is the base of it. So again, it's very allergy friendly, um, no soy, no nuts. Screamers also makes two cheeses in-house, an almond-based Parmesan and an ultra creamy ricotta. Today we're gonna make our almond ricotta, um, which goes on a lot of our four pizzas. Yay, I'm yeah. excited. Okay, so I see you soak the almonds to soften them, but they're also blanched as well. There's no skin on them. So why is that happening there? Yeah, because the skin tends to, one, um, give you like a little bit of a, a different mouthfeel. It's, um, it's a little bit, uh, yeah, a little bit grainy and also just for color purposes. Okay, should we get started? What are we doing first? So we're going to put in our um, soaked and blanched almonds into the Roboku. All right, and then okay. next we're going to go with the salt. Lactic acid goes in there next. Why are we using lactic acid here? So it gives it a little bit of a tang, you know, that um, you know every cheese tends to have. We achieve that by putting the lactic acid in there. All right. Yeah. And then this is the blended oil. It's a little bit of vegetable oil and a little bit of um, olive oil. And then we're just gonna snap the lid on here. The mixture blends for a couple minutes. Once everything gets creamy, it's time for a taste. Are we done? Yeah, that we're looks done. It's delicious. You want to give it a try? I really would. All right. I thought you never asked. Yeah, for sure. Mmm. Pretty good, right? Very creamy like ricotta. Joy, it feels wrong to have cheese without the pizza. Sure. So what can we put this almond ricotta on top of? Well, we're going to show you one of our most popular pizzas, like we mentioned before, the buffalo cauliflower. Um, yeah, so we'll use the cheese that we just made for that. All right, what are we starting with? So um, this is the, our dough. We make all of our dough in-house. I'd say the most challenging part about making pizza at home is probably stretching the dough, mm -hmm. right? So you want to start by flouring both sides so it doesn't stick. Um, and then we're going to press out all of the air bubbles. And while pressing out the air bubbles, you're kind of like keeping it in this circle shape. So it makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to stretch and still be formed into this like perfect, beautiful circle. All right, so now that we've gotten our air bubbles out here, we're gonna flip it over on our hand and start the stretching process. <laughs> it's like you literally do this in your sleep. I know, I mean, I probably could, I probably have. All right, so wow. there we are. Did yeah. you just see that though? That was like in two seconds. 
What is the trick to spreading sauce pr appropriately okay. and well? So you want to, I always start in the middle and then I, I circle out like this and I push, um, push the sauce to the sides. So it's like a little bit of like hypnosis going on. <laughs> yeah. So take a big handful of the cheese and I will say, I'm gonna give you a little cheese spreading advice here. Okay. You wanna start high and then just kind of sprinkle it all around so you get an even coat, okay? Okay, all right. You're doing great. Okay, yeah, I was looking for affirmation really quick. <laughs> yes, I, you're doing a great job. Can you see that? The pizza gets a few generous dollops of that luscious ricotta. How does this bake off? Well, it actually gets a little bit crispy on top, which makes it so, so delicious. Okay, what's next? All right, so then we're going to put our uh, buffalo cauliflower on top. Oh. Yeah. Okay, tell me about how you prepare the cauliflower. Okay, for sure. So we make our own buffalo sauce here, and we take, um, we break down cauliflower and we cook the cauliflower in buffalo sauce. How hot is this oven and how long are we keeping our pizza in there for? So we keep the oven between 500 and 550, um, and it's gonna cook for about six, six, six or seven minutes. Okay. Yeah, so super quick. Quick. Yep, and then it'll be nice, crispy, and uh, golden brown on the edges, and that's how you know it's done. The seven minute wait, it felt like eternity. How's it doing in there? Oh, she, oh. she, she beautiful. All right, let's oh. take one more peek at the bottom here. What oh. do you think? I think it looks gorgeous. I think she's What do you cool. think? I think I think she's ready. Joy, I've got to document this process. Okay. It's just simply a part of my brand. Okay, do it. All right, you ready? I'm ready. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> that looks so fire. Are you kidding me? I know, right? The pizza is served up in true New York style. You're not eating off of a paper plate. Are you eating pizza? Are you even eating a Are New York you, pizza? No. Amazing slice job. Boom. Come on. <laughs> what do you think? Stop. So good, right? This tastes like real pizza. Yeah. I don't even want to say real pizza. It just tastes, tastes like, like regular pizza. dairy pizza. Yeah. It's so good. It's so delicious. Yeah. What does it mean to you, Joy, to be creating this traditional New York slice that's vegan, that gives so many more people an option? It's awesome. I mean, when people come to New York, when people think about New York, one of the things they, they think about is pizza. You know, they wanna check that box off. Oh, I had a New York pizza. So it's really, really awesome that we've given the option to every single person to be able to do that, you know? You know what I also really like uh, to hear is um, people who have dairy allergies or even parents with their children that have dairy allergies and they are always so happy that we exist because otherwise they wouldn't be able to have pizza and like uh, such a big part of a kid like childhood is eating pizza, right? Yeah. Yeah. We do a lot of like uh, little kids pizza parties and stuff like that, cute. you know, it's so <laughs> cute. So, you know, it's like that little bit of normalcy. It's like, oh, I can't have dairy, but still have really good pizza. What are some of your favorite reactions from vegans and non-vegans alike who try your pizza for the first time? Like a non-vegan reaction, they are like, oh, it's actually good. And you're like, I told you so. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of people that come in and this is their favorite pizza spot and they are not vegan. If you can't travel to Brooklyn for a screamer's pie, don't worry. I've got your dairy-free cheese cravings covered. Up next, I'm making my super creamy cashew queso.
favorite things to make when I'm having friends over, if I want a really delicious snack by myself, it's my roasted jalapeno queso. You might be wondering, a plant-based version of queso? Are you okay, Sama? But to that I say, I'm perfect. Chile con queso is a Tex-Mex classic that's traditionally made with a great melting cheese and green chilies. We're using cashews as the base and nutritional yeast for a cheesy, savory flavor. And jalapeno, I can't forget about our spice. It's super creamy and cheesy. You won't even miss the dairy. Because I like a little spice in everything that I do, we're adding jalapeno to our queso. I like roasting the jalapeno to get that really smoky, delicious flavor. You've got your jalapeno, drizzle it generously with some olive oil. I like to just rub the jalapeno in the oil just to get it nicely coated. All right, say goodbye to our jalapeno. It's about to get roasted. See you later. The jalapenos roast at 400 degrees for about 10 minutes until lightly charred. Look at our jalapeno. She's cooled. It's blackened on the outside. Also, you'll notice that when you let the jalapeno cool, it's gonna get a little wrinkly, that's totally fine. My secret weapon in creating a really delicious and creamy queso, cashews. I soak them either overnight or flash soak them for an hour in hot water. This allows the cashews to expand. They really get nice and pliable and soft. The first thing I'm gonna do is drain my cashews. Now I'm just gonna add them to my blender. Cashews are in, now I'm just gonna add two cloves of garlic. You might be wondering how I'm gonna make this queso cheesy without the cheese, and to that I say nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is one of my secret weapons in my plant-based repertoire. It's really amazing for creating a savory and cheesy taste to everything you add it to. Beautiful. This is such a super simple recipe, it's actually crazy. Everything's going into a blender. We're gonna add some salt and some freshly ground black pepper. And don't forget our gorgeous jalapeno. Now to help everything come together, I'm just adding a little bit of vegetable broth. You could use water, I just like using veggie broth because it adds some more taste, some more flavor, and we love more flavor when we're cooking, right? Beautiful. Now we get to blend. Are you excited? I'm excited. All right, let's blend. All right, let's check the texture. <gasps> Creamy, velvety, queso-y, not a word, but I have my own dictionary. I don't know if you knew that. It's beautiful. My chips have arrived. I'm ready to plate my queso and I'm very excited about it because then I get to eat it. And that's what we're all here for. Check out this texture, okay? <gasps> Are you checking it out? You sure? Creamy, cheesy, but no cream or cheese, crazy. All right, I want this to look really cute, so I'm just gonna smooth the top out, the back of my spoon, like so. A very simple garnish, just a little bit of pepper. Could you believe it could be that easy? Cheesy, delicious, creamy queso, no dairy involved. Now I get to eat it. Here I go. Chip ready to take a dip. Hmm. Do you see that? Wow. Ooh, that heat is so good. Mm. This is in my cookbook, so I've obviously made this a bunch of times, but it's so good every time. Queso is perfect to share, so luckily I have my whole crew here. So guys, I don't know what you're doing. Get in here. Come on. That's more like it. <laughs> Teamwork, awesome. Love that for us. I hope this showed you can make really creamy, delicious, and cheesy recipes without the dairy. It's amazing. You have to try it. Not to be cheesy, or to be cheesy, I hope this inspired you to try cheese without the dairy because it is just as delicious and versatile.
It's so Perfect. beautiful. And it I would great. literally look at this and never know that there were no eggs in this. No eggs. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Incredible edible eggs really are, well, pretty incredible. From a simple hard-boiled egg to a stunning souffle, eggs are essential parts of so many meals. They give great lift to pastry, make dishes super decadent, and they're also just delicious on their own. But how do you replace them in a plant-based diet? I'm going on a cross-country hunt to find out how chefs are cooking up savory meals and sweets all without cracking a single egg. Right now, it's breakfast time. So I'm headed to a local spot right here in Brooklyn that's turning chickpea flour into a breakfast staple, the perfect scramble. Hi, Sama. Amanda, nice, nice to meet you. Amanda. Nice to meet you, Cheyenne. Cheyenne, nice to meet you. So excited to be here. Should yeah. we get inside? Let's do it. Let's, Let's go. go for it. Awesome. Cheyenne Willis and Amanda Fox own and operate Satan's Helper in Brooklyn, New York. The couple, who wed in 2016, dish up vegan twists on classic New York City deli dishes. Their specialty? Remaking breakfast staples with a variety of plant-based eggs. A lot of people, when they go plant-based or they try and start eating a more vegan diet, right? Mm -hmm. Eggs are something that people seem to miss. So you do a lot of really interesting things with eggs here. And I want to know, how do you mimic the texture and the flavor of a regular egg? Tofu just is never going to be <laughs> eggs, so you just have to get to that closeness. Yeah. So with our tofu scramble, Cheyenne uses a process of doing three different kinds of uh, tofus. So they'll do one block of tofu in cubes, so you get that like little cube aspect. They blend some aspect to make it creamy, and then some they match with their hands. So you get like a different sort of a scramble, like a creamy scramble with like little bits of bite to it. From tofu scrambles to a chickpea-based omelet, there's no shortage of creative plates here. There's a lot of different avenues you can take with plant-based food, right? So why did you choose a vegan deli? We're both from Pennsylvania. We both come from like getting your sandwich from the grocery store. And it's just like a classic nostalgic feeling. I grew up cooking with my grandparents and my mom, and it was just always classic Americana food. So we decided that this would be the most natural road for us to take. Um, and this is just what came naturally to us. Amanda and Cheyenne first met during high school in Pennsylvania. A few years after graduation, they reconnected and quickly fell in love over their shared passion for cooking. We've just been always obsessed with food. Cheyenne's actually a classically trained pastry chef. The two moved to Brooklyn and worked together at several restaurants across New York City. They tied the knot at Dunwell, a vegan donut shop in Williamsburg. What is your favorite part about working with Cheyenne? We're in each other's brains, 100%. <laughs> After working in traditional restaurants, they both had dreams of creating a more equitable eatery, run with a focus on treating staff fairly. So we decided that when we made our space that it would be everybody's on the same playing field. We're all equal. It doesn't matter who technically owns it. It doesn't matter who does what or whatever. Everybody gets paid the same. We all are just here working together as a team. In 2018, Amanda and Cheyenne started running a vegan pop-up, serving homemade seitan at various locations around Brooklyn. Seitan, the restaurant's namesake, is a high-protein meat substitute made from wheat gluten. The chefs use seitan to recreate plant-based deli meats, like bacon and roast beef. I think the interesting thing about our food is we base it on those flavors that you're so used to. So when we were coming up with our salami recipe, I was like, okay, so what goes into actual salami? And we took those ideas and those flavors, so it became the base for this nostalgic food that we can now make vegan. After a successful run, the pop-up graduated to a storefront in 2020. Putting down roots in a permanent location was vital for the couple, who wanted to create an inclusive space for vegan and queer communities. We get to meet so many different types of people, and obviously because we're a queer-owned company, we attract all the queers, which is perfect with me. We have our loyal customers that have been with us from the jump. 
the same person who ordered from my very first pop-up came in the other day. I was certainly ready for my breakfast sandwich. Cheyenne took me into the kitchen to make a Satan's Helper signature. All right, so what are we making first, Cheyenne? So we're gonna start with the nomlets, our chickpea flour-based egg. You say nomlet? Nomlet, Like yes. nom nom. Absolutely. I love that. Yes. <laughs> so we're gonna start with some chickpea flour here. Okay. To make a perfect nomlet, building the right eggy texture is key. Cheyenne mixes oat milk, lemon juice, and oil with chickpea flour, or basin, a common ingredient in Indian cuisine. Have you tested this with other flours, or have you landed on chickpea flour being the best for I an eggy? I definitely try with regular flour, but it is weird. So that's why we use the chickpea, just to okay. keep it like, lighter, fluffier, okay. less harsh. It looks really nice. It smells good already. Yeah. A few simple spices amp up the flavor and color of the dish. A lot of spices in here to Tons. make it nice and nomlety. Yeah, <laughs> delicious. I feel that uh, a lot of times in vegan cooking, people don't add a lot of spices. Cheyenne's secret to upping the savory factor is kala namak, or Himalayan black salt, which comes from North India. It adds this, so this really <laughs> wonderful um, sulfuric acid taste and brings that egg flavor really to the that front. That egginess, yeah. 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 The nomlet cooks for about five minutes before getting a flip. Look at that. Stunning. Gorgeous. Yeah. So we'll know when she's done, when she's a little bit firm. Okay. Yeah, she's pretty much good to go. This looks really good and it smells amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. It's like, it's such, it's giving me such a savory pancake vibe, mm -hmm. even though it is also an omelet. So I love it. The omelet is served with even more plant-based breakfast staples. All right, so I have our housemate. The bacon. Bacon here. This is made out of seitan, I'm It assuming. is, and there's like oats and cheese, Ooh. jalapenos, a bunch of wow. fun stuff in here. We do not skimp on anything. Love that. And so I fried this up, and we're just gonna lay this gently down. Amazing. Just give it a little bit of fluff there. Love it. And then we would just close the lid up. Ta-da, a totally vegan BEC. Here I go. Woo! Whoa. Whoa, Cheyenne, whoa. Lots of flavors. The omelet is crispy. The bacon is super flavorful. It's delicious. Thank you. The eggless egg sandwich really blew me away. Now it's time for lunch, and I happen to know a fantastic ramen spot on the other side of the country. Among the countless ramen spots out there, Ramen Hood in downtown Los Angeles is truly something special. Everything on the menu is totally vegan. Ramen Hood was co-founded by Top Chef Season 2 winner Ilan Hall and world-renowned chef Rahul Kapkar in 2015. There you go. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. I'm so excited. Ramen Hood is one of just a few restaurants in the country specializing in plant-based ramen. 
and they were the first to offer a vegan soft-boiled egg, a traditional topping for this comforting soup. Rahul, you yes. make vegan ramen. Can you tell me about why you do that and how this all got started? Uh, it was actually my friend's idea. I was working in Denmark at the time, and he called me and he was like, hey, I have this idea for a vegan noodle concept. That friend was Ilan, who had been running Esh, an Israeli barbecue joint in Brooklyn. Why make it vegan? <laughs> my business partner had a restaurant that was very meat heavy, and he was catching a lot of flack from vegans on Twitter. <laughs> and that is kind of, it's not like the catalyst, but he was just kind of like, all right, well, I mean, I can do vegan food. In 2014, Elon invited Rahul to cross the Atlantic and bring his expertise from one of the world's most prestigious fine dining restaurants, Noma in Copenhagen. Part of the reason he called me was because the restaurant I was working at, we were serving, I think, like 24 courses at the time, and like 16 of them were vegetable forward. And then once we kind of started talking about it and refining it, it just made sense for us to do ramen. Ramen's something I grew up eating. It's like a real uh, kind of like comfort food for me and definitely nostalgic. I used to come home from school and have a bowl with my grandmother. Traditional ramen broth is usually made with pork, beef, or chicken bones. Sometimes it's a combo. But Ramen Hood uses vegan dashi, a liquid base made from kanbu and shiitake mushrooms. This is a spicy garlic sunflower seed broth. Uh, we've got some bean sprouts in here, baby bok choy, uh, king oyster mushrooms, scallions, sesame seeds, chili thread. After pressure cooking and blending the ingredients with sunflower seeds, the chefs are able to create a creamy, umami-rich broth without any animal protein. But Rahul thought their vegan bowls wouldn't be complete without a classic topping, a creamy, soft-boiled egg. Why was it important for you to add this vegan egg into um, this ramen? People expect an egg and ramen. It provides that creamy texture that kind of people are looking for. And in like a traditional bowl, it can be a really nice, like different thing to be eating. Like you've got chewy noodles and you've got this pork and then, you know, you've got an egg that's like a soft boiled egg. It just makes the broth richer and it kind of makes your entire experience eating the bowl feel richer. Ramen Hood's secret? Mixing the dashi from their ramen broth with agar, a gelatin made from seaweed. Teach me how to make this. Yeah, this is pretty straightforward. So we're gonna take 500 grams of our broth. Okay. This is the agar here. We're just gonna put a little bit in. Dump this in here. So I'm stirring this around to make sure the agar doesn't clump and settle. Okay. And how long does it take to get to the point where you want it to be? Um, not long. It'll take a, just a couple minutes. After the agar mixture simmers, it's poured into a custom mold to create an egg shape. How many of these do you make a day? Uh, about 150. Within just a few minutes, the liquid firms up, and it looks and feels just like a boiled egg white. This literally tastes like... First of all, this tastes so good. It tastes like ramen broth, like a lot of umami. But also the texture is very egg white. Yeah, because it's this just the broth. It's, like, it's got the richness from the sunflower seeds. Yeah. To make a whole egg, the chef uses a melon baller to scoop out room for the yolks. That's so crazy how like gelatinous it is. Like an egg white. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna go. Don't judge me. First time. That was pretty good. That was better than most people's first try. When the egg whites are firm, it's time to fill them with the creamy yolk. It's vegan mayo with food coloring and black salt, like okay. Indian black Call salt. Yeah. yeah, so it's got the uh, egg flavor to it. Okay, yeah. cool. And you so, just pipe it in? Yeah, here. Yeah, that's it. You just I'm go, like looking for my affirmation. Just, just go to, <laughs> yeah, just do the rest of them. There you go. This jiggly, soft-boiled egg helps complete a ramen experience that hasn't been available to many vegan foodies for years. Okay, I'm going for the egg. I feel like I owe it to us to go for the egg. I think you should just one bite it. Wow, it's so good. I just, Thank I you. truly haven't had ramen in years because I mostly can't eat it anywhere. So this is revolutionary for my life. Like, this is a plot twist for me. I love it. I'm coming back. I'm bringing my parents next time. 
This vegan hard-boiled egg might be pretty advanced for a home chef. But I've got a super easy egg swap for baked goods that only requires two ingredients. If you're looking to replace eggs in your baked goods, maybe you're allergic, you're vegan, or you simply don't like eggs, a flax egg might be the substitute for you. I'm gonna show you how to make two flax eggs today. So we're using two tablespoons of flaxseed meal with five tablespoons of warm water. You can see it right here. This is gonna blow your mind. It's super simple. Grab your flaxseed meal, add it to a bowl, clean bowl. And next, I'm just gonna add my warm water. I know, it's challenging, right? We want to give this a nice little stir, get everything nice and incorporated. All of the flax should get in there. We're going to let this sit aside for about five minutes until it gets nice and thick and gelatinous. After, you can use it as a sub for your eggs and your baked goods. So I'm just going to let it hang out. It's going to chill out, have some spa time. See you soon. Welcome back. It's been five minutes while I waited for my flax egg to do its thing. You want to wait until it's nice and gelatinous. So that might take you a couple extra minutes. No worries. Let's check the texture. Check this out. She's thick, gelatinous. I keep saying that word, but it's true. Flax eggs really work like eggs to help bind and thicken your baked good. It's not going to rise exactly like eggs would, but you're not going to taste it at all. It's still going to be a delicious and perfectly baked baked good. I'm not saying this belongs in a museum, but it might belong in your cookies, okay? Flaxseed isn't the only swap vegan bakers can use to replace eggs. One bakery in Portland is using all sorts of different ingredients, from applesauce to tofu, to make plant-based desserts that are totally decadent.
When it comes to pastry and baked goods, eggs are pretty egg central. They definitely help bind things together in baking. They provide moisture. They have some fat and protein, which just provide the structure for the baked good, you know, for it to, to rise, they give lift. So they are really hard to replace. This is Lisa Clark, the founder of Petunias, Portland's first all vegan and gluten-free bakery. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming in. She's also an expert in egg-free baking. It really depends on the product that we're making and the qualities that each egg substitute has and what you want the end result to be like. And the other ingredients that are in the recipe, you know, it has to work well with what you're making. We use a lot of coconut yogurt, which gives a lot of moisture and it helps make things a little lighter. Applesauce also does help to give moisture um, and a little bit of lift. And chia seed meal, I love, and it's very healthy for you, which is added bonus. We use this like in our chocolate chip cookie. It works really well in cookies to help bind things together and give a nice texture. This is silken tofu that's pureed with a, a milk, so you could use coconut milk, almond milk, rice milk with an immersion blender. That's really nice in like a pound cake that we make or a poppy seed muffin that we make. It helps give some structure and stability. In 2003, Lisa learned she was intolerant to dairy, gluten, and eggs. She decided to take control of her diet by turning to one of her favorite childhood hobbies. My mom is who taught me how to bake, and it's just something we did together all the time. She had ALS when I was a child, and she passed away when I was 12, uh, which was really, really hard, and so there wasn't a lot that we could do together because she was so limited physically. She was in a wheelchair, and I was the youngest of three, and I was home with her all the time and helped take care of her. Um, and one thing she could do was just explain to me how to bake and tell me what to do, and I would have our little KitchenAid mixer and you know follow the directions and get up on my stool and do it, and I loved it. And it's one thing that we could do to bond and to do something together. She had a little ceramic pig's head that hung over the stove when I was a kid, and her name was Petunia the Pig. And so when I was trying to think of a business name, I remember the pig who was at my dad's house, and I thought, that's perfect, Petunia. Lisa adopted her mom's recipes to be gluten-free and vegan. It took her months of experimenting before she was finally ready to start selling her baked goods. I remember when I started doing this, I, I really didn't have doubt. I knew that it was gonna go well, and I knew that there were other people like me that had dietary restrictions or lived a different lifestyle, and that there was um, a niche to fill. Petunia's pies and pastries started as a booth at Portland's Farmer's Market in 2009. Lisa's cowgirl cookies, pecan sticky buns, and gorgeous cupcakes immediately appealed to people with various food allergies. Every week, every day, I would go set up my, do my whole setup, set up my table, my booth, and get out there. And there were so many people that would come, wait in line, like down the whole farmer's market for, I don't know how long. I would have people come and just be in, in tears because they haven't been able to eat like a donut for 20 years or something. Or, you know, kids come with food allergies um, and moms crying because they can't find a cupcake for them and now they can have a cupcake. And um, that makes me emotional. <laughs> It's awesome to see that gluten-free, vegan, dairy-free, egg allergy, whatever it is, we can accommodate these people and make everyone feel special and everyone feel included and just bring joy to everybody that we can. Petunias has expanded over the last decade. They have a bakery in downtown Portland and a national wholesale business. It's a family affair to keep things running. Lisa's husband, Jacob Williamson, is a former barista. He manages all things coffee in the bakery. Her sister, Erica Clark, runs the wholesale business and the company's social media accounts. But I'm here to learn all about Lisa's innovative egg substitutes. I'm really interested to know how you landed on all of these different egg subs. How did yeah. you figure all of this out? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know how I figured it out. Actually, I think just a lot of practice and testing mm -hmm. recipes over and over and you change one thing every time <laughs> so you end up eating a lot of like wasted pastries. <laughs> but but eventually you arrive at this is the right mix and you find it and you keep it. On the menu today, decadent chocolate cupcakes. What are we doing first? So we're gonna make the chocolate cake batter first. We have our flour blend here right. you can put in there, which has rice flour, 
millet flour, tapioca flour, and flaxseed meal. Oh. And then we have our natural cocoa powder that's sifted. And then we have all of our leavenings and our salt. Whisk that. I love a whisk. <laughs> Instead of eggs, this batter stays moist thanks to a special squash, pumpkin. It's gonna give it some structure. And a lot of um, gluten-free products, especially without the egg too, it can, they can dry out pretty easily, but like the pumpkin and applesauce um, help bind it together, but also they do give a lot of fluff um, and moisture, right. so it works out perfectly. Next in, organic canola oil, coconut milk, sugar, and espresso to really pump up that chocolate flavor. So now we can add the dry ingredients. This looks so amazing. I love batter. It's a struggle to get it to the pan sometimes. Oh yeah, totally. So I came prepared with oh a my spoon gosh. to taste it. Yeah, try it. As all normal it? people do. Right. right. I love you're prepared. Right. Okay. Mmm. <laughs> Look good. That was good. It's crazy because you really don't even need eggs for this. You for it really to taste don't. Delicious. Yeah, you don't. That's the thing. I just there's. I feel like you really can make everything without eggs, and they're just not necessary. So why not do it a different way? The batter is much thicker than a traditional cake batter, making it super easy to scoop out perfectly even portions. That looks great. Super cute. Perfect. Very yeah. fluffy. It's it a is very fluffy batter. It is very fluffy. Yeah. Why is it so fluffy? It well, I think it's just, I think we just did a really good job. We just did an amazing job. <laughs> We're gonna bake them at 350 in the uh -huh. oven for about 20 to 22 minutes or until um, you put a toothpick in the center and it comes out clean. Now to the most artistic part of baking, decorating. Lisa uses dairy-free butter to make super creamy frosting that also pipes well. This is our salted peanut butter buttercream, which is amazing. It's so good. This is the fun part, and you just have to not worry too much. I always say that cakes and cupcakes can smell fear, so if you're <laughs> hesitant, it's not gonna work out. You try it. I'm going really heavy. You did a great job. Am I hired? It's perfect, okay. yeah, I love it. The cupcakes are topped with melted ganache and torched marshmallows. Bubbling up. <laughs> Voila, a beautiful chocolate cupcake with a plant-based twist. Look at that. It's Perfect. so beautiful. And it I would great. literally look at this and never know that there were no eggs in this. No eggs. Oh my God. <laughs> you know what's crazy is you can't have peanuts. I can't. But I do know someone who can. Yes. Your husband, Jacob. He can, Jacob, yeah. You have to come he share this with loves me. peanut come on. butter. Cheers. Cheers. This is insane. This is like, this is honestly so delicious, <laughs> so fluffy. <laughs> it's got so much texture and flavor. Truly, if somebody it. gave this to me, I would have no idea that this is a plant-based vegan. Good. Lisa's cupcakes are out of this world, and she says she owes it all to her biggest inspiration. Your mom really started your love for baking, so what does it feel like to open this bakery as a tribute and in honor of her? I know my yeah. mom sees all this, for sure. She's like guardian angel watching over us, helping me along the way, and I know that she would be so proud. Are you ready? Whether you're skipping eggs for an allergy or because you're vegan, there are so many more options now. Culinary innovation is making eggs more accessible to everyone. This is crazy. Yeah. This is like, it's like a, the best floral arrangement I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants.
and I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. I love mushrooms. I mean, I really, really love mushrooms. They are an essential part of a plant-based lifestyle because they're such an easy swap for me. But I've got lots of questions about fungi. How do they grow? Where do they grow? And which types have the most unique texture? I'm gonna learn all about their culinary range with chef and mushroom enthusiast, my friend, Sophia Rowe. Then I'll travel to Colorado to see how mushroom roots are being transformed into a hearty new protein. But first, I wanna learn some basics. So, I'm heading out to Smallholds, an innovative farm in Brooklyn, New York. Let's go. When you think about mushrooms, you probably think of those capped little fungi. But there are literally thousands of edible mushrooms out there. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of mushroom. A lot of people think that they don't like mushrooms because they're used to eating the same mushroom and they think all mushrooms are the same, but they're not. It's like saying you don't like mushrooms is like saying you don't like plants. Um, like, a, like the differences between a trumpet and an oyster and a button mushroom, it's like saying like an almond tree versus a head of lettuce. Um, and an apple, you know, they're very different. <laughs> Andrew Carter and Adam DiMartino founded Smallholds, an organic mushroom farm in 2017. They share a passion for rare mushroom varieties and want to bring those tastes and textures to more people. There's a whole kingdom out there and everyone's used to eating the same mushroom. A white and a brown mushroom and a portobello mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. That's right, white button, crumini, and portobello are all the same type of mushroom. Their scientific name is agaricus, if you want to be fancy about it. The industry grows those because that's what they're used to growing. Consumers are used to consuming those. You can look at other regions, like if you go to China or Japan or Korea, the mushroom industry is way more advanced than it is here. It's so like consumers in certain regions are eating 10 to 20 times as much mushrooms as people are in the United States. So what were your first steps to starting Smallhold? The early beginning was uh, building out a lab in a basement at a house, and it looked crazy. Andrew and Adam started experimenting with trumpet mushrooms. After perfecting the process, they expanded to shiitake and oyster. In just five years, that basement startup moved into a shipping container, then to their first farm in Brooklyn. The company has grown rapidly with funds from dozens of investors and a soaring demand for mushrooms. Over the last few years is that people really started getting interested in food as medicine, trying to eat less meat, trying to be sustainable, trying to eat local. All of these things ended up just kind of centering around mushrooms. In 2020, organic mushroom sales grew by 20%. Feeding that demand, Smallhold now grows 15 different types of mushrooms, producing a whopping 1.5 million pounds each year for hundreds of grocery stores and restaurants. Mushrooms are grown by a process called inoculation. A spore is placed deep inside a substrate, like a log. The spores germinate, then feed on the wood, growing into mycelium, or mushroom roots. This fruiting body is probably like four, four days, four or five days old. It takes about four weeks for the roots to be fully grown. That's when cute baby mushrooms called pins start to appear on the surface. In about a week, they're ready to harvest. Fungi are its own kingdom. They're functionally more similar to animals than they are like plants. They breathe in oxygen, they release CO2, they digest stuff, they don't go through photosynthesis and so their interaction with the environment is just so different than plants. Traditional mushroom farms cultivate their fungi in mulch with a mix of hay, straw, and corn cob. But Smallhold is focused on growing in urban areas to make the entire operation more sustainable. City farms might seem strange, but fungi don't require a lot of light, water, or space to thrive. Our mushrooms, we grow, they're called saprotrophic mushrooms, and so they're wood-loving mushrooms. They digest wood. All of the substrates that we're using, that's the stuff that's inside of this block. About 90% of it is sawdust. Smallhold's mushrooms are grown in bags filled with a compound from mills and factories, so they're reusing a byproduct from the timber industry. And those futuristic containers don't just look cool. And so these chambers themselves have really intricate controls over all the climate that they're exposed to. That allows them to forego pesticides. Plus, the fragile mushrooms aren't susceptible to extreme weather. 
Can you walk me through the environmental impact of growing mushrooms? It's one of the most sustainable products you can probably find in the grocery store. We did a big life cycle analysis, which is a large like, third-party analysis to understand exactly what's going on with your company. Our carbon impact was about 30% less than any other mushroom farm we could find. Over 60% of the country's mushrooms are grown in one Pennsylvania county, which means it takes a lot of fuel to ship them across the country. So a lot of mushrooms are actually imported from overseas, and so the carbon footprint of those is really crazy. Smallholds mushrooms are grown in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and Austin, Texas. They also operate over a dozen mini farms, custom-built tanks that can grow mushrooms inside restaurants and grocery stores. With farms in strategically placed cities, Smallhold plans to reduce carbon emissions by continuing to ship locally. When you're buying a product from Smallhold, like a fresh mushroom in a grocery store, it was grown close to there. And so we have a national brand, like you can be from New York and go to LA and recognize Smallhold on the shelf, but those mushrooms were grown in LA. Most mushrooms also have a naturally meaty texture, which makes them a great vegetarian swap. The more people eat these products, generally speaking, they're eating less meat, whether they realize it or not. And so every time we get someone to eat a little less beef or a little less chicken, then we think that we have a larger impact on the planet because it's less carbon intensive, less water intensive. Okay, Andrew, we're gonna harvest these mushrooms, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. We have uh, blue oysters, we have lion's mane, yellow oysters, and trumpet mushrooms. Um, but we can start with the blue oyster. Let's do this it. This one's pretty fun because, you know, you can't make any promises, but a lot of the time, you kind of get the whole thing just in one pick. Whoa! Like that. Here you go. Ah. And so, big, <laughs> big blue oyster. Wait, mushroom. this is so dense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You uh, take a big cluster of mushrooms uh -huh. and you shove like garlic in here, like whatever herbs you want, so thyme and rosemary, but you just kind of like shove it inside the cluster itself. Do you roast the whole thing? And you just roast the whole thing. So, let's try the lion's mane. So, I would just pick off. Pick off one of those. Yeah, there you go. Lion's mane is so beautiful and so unique. And this to me is like the most otherworldly mushroom because it just looks like no other. It, when you uh, you can take it apart, it like kind of peels sort of like mozzarella. It's so or, like, crazy. A lot of people use it as like a shellfish replacement. Because um, you can pull it like. It's yeah, almost stringy. Next, we harvested yellow oyster mushrooms, which were more delicate than their blue cousins. They'd be perfect in a creamy soup. But even Andrew has a favorite fungi. I love trumpets so much, and so if you cut it, uh, this isn't the best knife skills, but you can cut them like this, and then you can have a nice scallop. Yeah. And these are probably the most popular for people who are trying to like imitate meat with a whole mushroom. And so the other mushrooms can give you the texture and the flavor, and nutrition and all that kind of stuff, but these can like really stand in as a fake scallop or a fake bacon. Why do you want people to eat more mushrooms? I mean, they're, they're great for you. There's a lot of nutrition. They're high in fiber, they have amazing antioxidants, they have vitamin D. And what I really like about them is that they have that umami and that experience that replaces meat. I already eat a lot of mushrooms, but I'm convinced now.
got me excited to try something with my new favorite fungi. So I invited mushroom enthusiast, James Beard award-winning chef, my friend Sophia Rowe to my kitchen. Hi! My friend, Sophia, I told you this before, that we are talking about mushrooms, and I was like, listen, I can't do this without Sophia. Talk to me about the role that mushrooms play in your work and in your world. I went to culinary school, and I was sort of kind of playing in that plant-based world, and I felt like fungi and mushrooms were a really great way to encourage a lot of depth, which I feel like in plant-based cooking, sometimes you kind of lose, you know? you Like meat and dairy, those things create a lot of depth. It's pretty remarkable the types of flavors that you can create. And this is not a new idea. They're, particularly in Asian cultures, they've been using different kinds of fungus for forever um, in their cooking. But for me, that was really when I was like, okay, this is sexy. Can you just talk to me about how you work with them? It's almost about like, what am I trying to create? You know, if someone's a very big meat person and they want to go plant-based for a minute or for a meal, I think it's really important to cook things in the same way that you cook meat, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And I don't even know that that's just mushrooms or just fungi, right? A lot of times with steaks, you're braising, you're roasting, you're searing. There's no reason you can't treat plants the same way. I'm, I'm just super excited to know what we're cooking today. Yes. Tell me about the dish and yes. uh, put me to work. All right, so what we have here is lion's mane. When I'm looking for a, a lion's mane, you want them to be kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been touching this one a lot. You don't want them to be slimy. You don't want them to stink. If they stink or they're slimy, they're no good. And that's kind of the rule, the general rule with any mushroom. Yeah. In terms of washing them, these are commercially cultivated. Mm -hmm. So they are not wild, these are not feral. So these are not gonna need to be like really, really washed. You just wanna wipe them down, they're good. Do not get your mushrooms wet. They don't <laughs> like it. So this is a good one, this is a great shape. So what okay. we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make like a lion's mushroom steak. And you'll see that I've kind of like, as I'm even talking, I'm kind of pressing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where, just for a second, we're kind of like trying to create like a little steak here, mm. like a little hanger steak. Why okay? are you using lion's mane here, Sophia? I think lion's mane is really delicious, mm. but it's great structure. So it's really great in terms of like replacing meat. If you can't find this, you can cook an oyster mushroom or even a big portobello in exactly the same method. Mm. So the, the key here is you're leaving it nice and whole. Okay. I kind of want to press these down. So I'm just going to score this one side. Okay. And why are you scoring it? So we want the flavor to get in, mm. doggy. We want it to be inside. <laughs> so we're gonna make this glaze. All right, let's so do it. Because we're attempting to make a steak, okay? <laughs> what we wanna do is we wanna help, we wanna help these lines made mushrooms along. Three tablespoons of vegan butter. If you wanna use regular butter, that, that's, that's your you house do and that. do whatever you want. All right, we like, we like it softened like this because we're gonna be whisking it up. We want this to be like glazed texture. Okay. Okay. We also have coconut aminos. It's just like a soy free soy sauce vibe. <laughs> okay, I also like it because it's a little sweet. Yes, it um, is. And for a glaze, that's really nice. So the sweetness is important because the sweetness is gonna give us caramelization. So grab the sesame. Yes. Get it? Love sesame it. oil. Love it. We love it. You could use toasted if you wanted, but this is just regular old sesame oil. Next up, ingredients to really up the umami factor. Miso, Dijon mustard, and tomato paste. We're gonna just get, some, get a good like, salt in there right. and then you're just gonna whiskey do dude so this is gonna get I think we have this on medium heat okay okay we have some grapeseed oil here the reason we're using grapeseed is high smoking point we're using cast iron you don't have to use cast iron you can use whatever you have um, so we're going um, score side down. down so what's gonna happen we're yeah gonna put them on we're gonna get a good sear on each side and then we're gonna brush our glaze on okay okay two minutes flip it two minutes then we're gonna take them off and we're gonna let them rest. Just like you would have Just steak. like meat. Just like meat. Crazy. We're gonna treat these just like meat. I love that. This is why we want this hot. Love it. Just drop it <laughs> down. What we can do here, this is like a little like a little tip too. You can mm. always just like just keep flatten it down. Yeah, same, same, like same you we do. For I'm sorry, do you have a sound club? <laughs> <laughs> I do now. So just, just, just to kind of encourage again, you want to, yep. want to encourage that flattening, right? Yep. Get it nice and thin, I and that way that. The, 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 the marinade is not having to penetrate so deep. You know how to make a steak, you know how to do these mushrooms. After three minutes, time for a flip. Wait. Look it, look it. Oh. Gorgina. So we're just going to brush this on, <laughs> almost like you're basting a steak or something. Oh, come on, baby. 
Everything about this feels like you are Van Gogh and I am your apprentice. Oh my God, you, but except you could do this, but you see the sizzle and the, you know? So what's gonna happen is these are gonna be sitting here, they're gonna be caramelizing, they're gonna be getting juicy. We're gonna take the rest of this glaze and we're gonna baste them a little bit. Ooh. So this is, this. the basting method is never gonna be bad. It's always gonna be good. I mean, look how gorgeous that looks. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, stunning. A few more minutes in the pan. Literally crazy. Uh, crazy, right? It kind of looks like me, too. Uh huh. These are gonna rest, okay? Okay. It's five minutes. He doesn't need to okay. be not Nothing trying to. Crazy. Like, nothing wild. As the mushrooms rested, Sophia chopped up some green onions for later. Then it was time to cut into the lion's mane steaks. It's meaty. Can we dog. show them? <laughs> like, they need to know. That looks Everyone really alert. meaty. <laughs> alert. <laughs> but even like, it almost, it's almost like, like you wouldn't really know. It kind of, it just looks like. Mm -hmm. Chicken. Sophia recommends serving the steaks over rice with a few garnishes. First, some sesame seeds, then chili crisp, then scallions. Just like me, Sophia loves a little spice. Come on. Mm. It's so good. Wait, this is. Mm. This is literally the best mushroom dish I've literally ever had. Mm, it's so good. I love it. It is an unfamiliar ingredient mm. cooked in a familiar format. Correct. So I think if you're a beginner, to mushrooms, mm -hmm. a really great thing to do is whatever you can find locally, just try cooking those mushrooms, whatever they are, mm -hmm. in this format. Mm -hmm. Try cooking them this way, yeah. and you're gonna get a completely new relationship to mushrooms. Also, for the people who are like, I hate mushrooms, just give the method a try, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we have to take a photo. Let's do it. Cause like, when have we ever done a little friend cooking sesh? Let's do it. We need to do it. We need a whole photo shoot. We need a, we need a, we need a whole photo shoot. <laughs> I love you, wait, give me a hug. Thank you for coming. Of course. <laughs> Sophia's lion's mane steak looked a lot like chicken, but one company in Colorado is completely transforming mushroom roots into an actual meat substitute. Meat substitutes are everywhere these days, and they're made with a wide variety of ingredients, from whole veggies to soy protein and different oils. Enter Meaty. Here in Boulder, Colorado, mushrooms are the main attraction, and I got an exclusive first look inside their new factory. Meaty isn't trying to replicate ground beef. They're mimicking whole cuts of meat, like steak or chicken breast. It's like a super meat. Yeah, it's a super meat. <laughs> where it has all the protein you would yeah. want for meat, 
and then all the fiber and vitamins and minerals you find in plants. Yeah. CEO Tyler Huggins founded Meaty in 2016 after earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Tell me your journey to Meaty and why you started this company. Well, let's we'll start off with, with meat. We, uh, we have a growing population, have a high demand for protein. Meat is, is a growing demand. Given my history uh, studying nature, I knew there was this really cool, magical, root-like structure in the soil. Biologists call it mycelium. We call it mushroom root. Tyler and his team developed a patent-pending process that turned the fuzzy, hair-like mycelium strands into a product that mimics the taste and texture of meat. Unlike mushrooms, you won't find the raw roots in any grocery store. Currently, Meaty sells a steak-like filet and a faux chicken cutlet that's available plain or with a crispy breading. And this is the place where it all comes together. This is it. This is where the magic happens right here. This is the future of food. The mushroom roots are grown inside these giant tanks. This is this where Meaty is grown, We right? essentially take one spore. Yep. It's like the fungi equivalent of a seed. Okay. We start growing up the mushroom root and then we throw it into this, into this tank. The tank is filled with water that's packed with nutrients mushroom roots need to thrive. And how long does it take to cultivate and grow and harvest meat? Extremely fast. In this facility, we're able to create the meat equivalent of a whole cow in just four days. So tell me how you replicate the texture of traditional meat. It all starts from the magic of this mushroom root. We grow it in-house in a clean uh, environment, so no exposure to heavy metals or pesticides wow. or herbicides or anything like that. At that state, it kind of looks like uh, applesauce. This is meaty in the raw form before it's processed. And when you form it into a, uh, a chicken breast-like shape or a steak, mm -hmm. those strands become the texture that is very similar. Again, eats just like traditional meat. You can eat it just like that. That's just all natural mushroom root. I'm gonna you eat know? it. <laughs> okay. It's a blank it's, canvas. It really tastes like, I don't want to say nothing, because yeah. there is like a little bit of something, but it is so, like you could throw flavor and spice on that. Including mushroom root, Meaty's Chicken Swap has just four ingredients, salt, natural flavoring, and acacia gum, a fiber used as a food stabilizer. But I had to know. Is it healthy? So one of our, our four ounce uh, steak has about 18 grams of protein. And then it has all the fiber and other vitamins and minerals you only find in plants. No cholesterol, no saturated fat, there's no sugar in it. Meaty is now available online, but it often sells out fast, really fast. The company is opening a second farm to meet demand, and Meaty will soon be available on supermarket shelves. What is the future of Meaty? We see there's a lot of interest in alternatives to traditional meat. But what we're doing differently is whole food protein, simple ingredient list, super nutritious, and whole cuts. I think that opens up an entirely new demographic and group of folks who, who are excited to embrace something like this. After hearing so much about these mushroom roots, I wanted to see how it really tasted.
In Boulder, Colorado, the folks behind Meaty are turning mushroom roots into a new meat substitute. At the factory's test kitchen, they're experimenting with the best ways to cook it. I met with Debbie Downing, the company's head research chef, to learn more. I'm so excited to try this. Will you show me how to cook it up? It's the mushroom root, right? right, right. When you think about cooking mushrooms, it likes to soak up that oil, soak up the sauce, Super porous, yeah. soak up anything that you give it. So best practices for our product is that we actually want to add oil to it first. Right. We want to just give a little bit of a drizzle here. Season with salt and pepper, a little oil in the pan, then time for the cutlet. All right, it's ready. Oh yeah. Sizzles really nicely. The chicken and steak both take about eight minutes to cook. Just like meat, the goal is to develop a nice sear for more flavor. I think it's ready. All right, to flip. ready? Yeah. Woo! I just gasped. I haven't eaten chicken in a while. Yeah. I used to, so I know what chicken tastes like. Yeah. But I haven't cooked it in forever. And first of all, this is like very similar in cook. Like when you look at the browning yeah. and the caramelization around the edges. Like, did you want to cut it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like kind of freaking it's out right now. Get into it. I know, I know. Sorry, Tyler. I'm just like, I'm processing. I can't get over how much it smells like chicken. And even looking at the texture, I'm going to pick it up and just show you. Oh my God, I just touched it for the first time. Too. It's like the the texture of it, of animal protein that you would normally see, I feel like it has that. But how? <laughs> That's the mushroom root, right? The fibers. That's the mycelium. Yeah, gives you that texture and that look. This is not chicken, but it really looks like it. Okay, I'm gonna taste it. Should I taste it? This will be your first time, like, yes. stressed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is there a mic I can drop? This is like taking me back to when I used to eat chicken. Literally. And I'm not just saying this as I'm on camera. Next up, the steak filet. All right, steak. I'm trying it. You need another mic to drop? I need another mic to drop. This is insane. Yeah. This tastes like red meat. I haven't had chicken nuggets in years, so I was really excited to try the crispy chicken. This kind of takes me back to days of like growing up and eating fried chicken. chicken this is, am I getting punked? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. But I wasn't done eating yet. The meaty team had a big surprise for me. Shut up! I'm leaving. <laughs> I've seen my book. Yep. This is from my book. I didn't know I was going to eat chicken and cry today. My masala mac and cheese and cabbage salad from my cookbook both got the meaty treatment with their chicken. I was so excited. Also on the menu, breakfast tacos and steak in a chimichurri sauce. I even got to try some products in development, a turkey deli meat and beef jerky. They were delicious. This is not gonna be cute. I'm just warning everyone now. <laughs> it is a pretty big sandwich. Mm. I'm taking this home. This, wow. You guys are all like crazy magicians. Like something weird is going on here. Whoa. That's breakfast. Yeah. In true me fashion, we need to take a selfie. So yes. if you don't mind, yes. we're gonna get in here. All right, say meaty. Meaty. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Yeah. This was so yeah. special. No, truly. thank you. I don't know if I can go on. My love for mushrooms has been cemented. From a delicious side dish to a show-stopping main, their culinary versatility is unparalleled. And that's what makes mushrooms truly magic. I mean, I was almost gonna wear a yellow dress. That would have been a lot of turmeric. Oh, that would have been cute. Set. We would have really like, <laughs> we would have been like real turmeric champions. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. 
and I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Turmeric, or Haldi in Hindi or Urdu, is prized for its golden yellow hue and the warm, earthy aroma it imparts to a variety of recipes. It has a rich history in South Asian cuisine and culture, and it's always been a fixture in my own home. Recently, many in the wellness community have also touted turmeric's potential health benefits, often labeling it as a superfood. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about one of my favorite spices. Are there any proven medicinal uses? Whether it's in root form, ground, or dried, how do you keep it fresh? I can't wait to share a comforting dish with turmeric that always transports me back to my mom's kitchen. But first, I want to get to the root of it all, literally. So I'm off to a farm growing turmeric in a surprising place, upstate New York. Growing up, turmeric added beautiful color and wonderful flavor to almost all of the dishes my mom cooked, from her masala veggies to her haldi rice. But she only used it in its dry ground form. I wanted to see just how my family's favorite spice is farmed, and I didn't have to fly all the way to India. Am I giving me a little tour? Yeah, that's right, you, let's yeah. Do it. About two hours north of New York City is Green Owl Farms in Rhinebeck. Suzanne Kelly converted her home to a working farm in 2013. Here, she grows potatoes, squash, and saffron. But her main crops are aromatics, namely garlic, ginger, and of course, turmeric. The turmeric plant kind of grows like a hand, then it will grow even more fingers right. off of that. Suzanne's love for agriculture began after college when she started growing vegetables. From graduate school in Florida to teaching at SUNY New Paltz, she never stopped gardening. What was your journey to getting to this point? I was an academic for a little over 10 years, yep, teaching women's gender and sexuality studies. And I was sort of longing to do something else. I had a big rambling garden and I was thinking a lot about agriculture at that time. Yeah. I just sort of decided to take the leap. Suzanne's home sits on less than an acre, but after some extensive research, she realized she had enough land to turn it into a farm. How did you learn so much about all of this? It's mostly self-taught. Yeah. Just really following what, you know, what the experts have been doing, learning from other farmers. But yeah, I never worked on a farm. Suzanne picked garlic, ginger, and turmeric as her main crops for strategic reasons. They can be grown without extra hands and don't need much space to yield enough to sell at farmer's markets. They can also easily be dried or ground up for sale during the winter. So give us a little explainer on turmeric. So turmeric is a rhizome that is traditionally used in uh, Southeast Asian, Middle Eastern, Indian cuisine. It's used as a spice. More people are probably familiar with it in its powder form that um, gets all ground up and dehydrated and then put in a jar and then we buy it in the spice rack of our supermarket. Turmeric is native to South Asia, specifically India, known for its warm tropical climate. So how do you grow turmeric in New York? I've been inspired by lots of other small farms that have been doing this in the Northeast for some time over the last, I don't know exactly when they started, but certainly over the last decade. I get my seed from um, from Hawaii. In Asia, there are more than 100 varieties of turmeric. Suzanne grows Indira yellow and Hawaiian red, which fare better in cooler places. You need at least 10 months to be able to grow it to full maturity, at which point it's how you find it in the grocery store, sort of with that hard, um, tough skin on the outside. Suzanne starts growing the delicate seeds in her climate-controlled basement in late February. I visited the farm in early summer to help Suzanne move the baby turmeric outdoors. This is a, about a hundred and I think 120 feet of, um, uh, of turmeric bed that we're gonna plant. I'm ready, okay. I've never been more ready. Turmeric, a rhizome, is closely related to ginger. Both have thick green stalks that grow upward above ground. The thick nodes and roots lie in the soil. The nodes, called rhizomes, are what we eat. So we're just gonna Loosen the soil like that, and then stick it in like that. And that's it. Wow. We're gonna do a plant them about four to six inches apart. All right, so, so I'm gonna, gonna loosen, loosen it up a bit. Okay. A little deeper. Okay. All right, so going straight in? Yep, straight in. Have fun in there. You did it. Did you see that? Did you see that? Okay. Excellent, good job. 
Good job. So you, am I you hired? You're really good. You are. I'm you hired. Are. You're okay. hired. Yep. I'm hired. Yep. I can do yep. Jobs, yep. Sorry. Now you just need to do 200 more of them. Okay. Okay, maybe cancel that. <laughs> May not have a new job. By mid-October, the young turmeric is ready for harvest. So we pick it young. You're sort of hustling to get it harvest right. be before the frost comes <laughs> because by November, by mid-November, you know, you might have snow. It's yeah. possible. With a short growing period before winter sets in, Suzanne picks the roots before the plant reaches full maturity. It has a kind of like fresh, young, kind of yellow, and in some cases red, depending upon the type, type of turmeric, kind of hue to it. Um, and the texture is a little bit different too. It's not as fibrous. It's more sort of like an apple when it's picked young. At the farmer's market where Suzanne sells her produce, she also hands out recipe cards to customers who may be unfamiliar with fresh turmeric. Suzanne, tell me a little bit about your customers' reactions when they see the turmeric. Well, the first reaction is, what is this? <laughs> yes, and then if they know what turmeric is, uh, they'll be like, oh yeah, I take that in a pill form. Right? Like this, a wellness this, angle. Like a wellness angle, yes, that really is about throwing it in your smoothie. Yeah, yeah and I think it's it's important to like educate, right, on that, on where it comes from. It's so interesting because I, I really have grown up around turmeric for as long as I can remember, obviously very important in Indian cuisine and medicine and all of that, but I've never planted it. So it's so cool. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity to literally oh, put it into the soil. That's it's just, great. It's amazing to have that connection, right, between something that you eat and something that actually grows yeah. from the ground. In India, turmeric's importance runs much deeper than its culinary use. It's a huge part of many traditions and daily life. To learn more about its cultural legacy, I met up with Dr. Baswati Bhattacharya, an MD who also practices Ayurvedic medicine. Her book on Ayurveda details the history and methods used in the ancient holistic practice. What is Ayurveda? It is the longevity, which is Ayush or Ayu. So longevity and how to live well, and Veda, which is the science or the knowingness. The medicine of Ayurveda is that part of not just staying well and being healthy, but also the other side, which is when you're sick, when you're diseased, how to get well. Ayurveda is based on ancient writings that promote whole body wellness through diet, physical activity, and mindful practices. So those of us who practice Ayurvedic medicine focus more on the food as medicine, lifestyle medicine, and medicinal herbs, medicinal oils. But when you say, what is Ayurveda? Ayurveda is just a philosophy. It's not a religion, but it's a philosophy like organic living. We shared a meal at Divya's Kitchen in New York City. Divya chefs apply Ayurvedic principles to all of their recipes, and turmeric is used in many of their dishes. This looks so delicious. We've got a Kichdi classic, we've got a cashew curry, and we've got a mung bean soup. In the traditional practice, turmeric is considered anti-inflammatory. It's used to treat a variety of issues, including digestive problems, PMS symptoms, and arthritis pain. And so the golden sense of turmeric goes all the way from being an antimicrobial that protects the body to an anti-inflammatory, and this idea that it really enriches the body. 
Another use that is not a spice in cooking is what we now today call turmeric latte, which is taking <laughs> milk and putting a teaspoon of turmeric in it yeah. and using that as an anti-inflammatory before bed. Many Ayurvedic health claims are not supported by Western medical experts, but scientists at places like UCLA and John Hopkins are conducting more research. What is sort of that importance of turmeric in Indian culture? Um, it's part of the sacredness of honoring our bodies, yeah. honoring our minds, and it's something that comes from the ground and protects us. There's a lot of cultural aspects of this. So there's a gaye holud, which is where the bride and groom will have their own family members before marriage cover their whole bodies in turmeric and give them a bath in that. And there's variations of it in different cultures, but having that bath cleanses them, gets them ready. When we were kids, if we ever had a boo-boo, one of the prized things we could show our friends is that mom put some haldi on our boo-boo, right? Instead of a band-aid, you'd go and show that there was this big yellow stained spot. And so the golden sense of turmeric, it really enriches the body. In Ayurveda, turmeric's healing elements make it an essential spice for the whole body and even the mind. But I wanted to learn more about the latest medical research on its purported health benefits. Family in India uses turmeric in almost every dish for many reasons, in part because they see the spice as a preservative and antiseptic. But recently in the US, turmeric is being hyped as a health supplement. You can find it in pills, powders, and even beauty products. But what does the science really say about its benefits? To learn more about its many uses, I met with spice expert and cookbook author Kanchan Koya, who also happens to have a PhD in biomedicine from Harvard. I'm so excited to talk about all things turmeric with you, but I want to know a little bit more about you. I'm a scientist by training. My lab started to study the health benefits of turmeric in cancer. I had grown up in India where turmeric is just a part and parcel of the everyday and because I had grown up with it, I had kind of rolled my eyes at all the obsessions around it. And then here I was doing my PhD, my lab is studying turmeric and it was a real aha moment for me that a lot of this ancient kind of ancestral wisdom around these spices is bearing fruit when it comes to modern research and I was like, okay, maybe there's something to it. Conscience Lab studied the yellow pigment found in turmeric, curcumin. So curcumin is one of the compounds in turmeric that has been best studied 
and it's a polyphenol, which is just a certain kind of chemical compound that has effects in our bodies. Conscience Research found that curcumin aided in chemotherapy, making it more effective in treating cancerous cells in breast cancer patients. The reason I hesitate to sort of think of curcumin as a cure-all is because we don't have that many randomized clinical trials looking at the effects of curcumin in a whole human. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't have benefits in a whole human, it just means we need more data. Different brands of ground turmeric have vastly different levels of curcumin, but the actual amount of the polyphenol isn't required on food packaging or supplement labels, so it's impossible to know how much you're actually getting. While ground turmeric is readily available in most grocery stores today, the whole root has been growing in popularity as home cooks and wellness devotees learn more about the spice. When I was younger, I never cooked with it fresh, so I was excited to try it in a new way. We're going to be talking all about turmeric, and you're going to show me how to make a fresh turmeric tea. Never used fresh turmeric until I tried this tea when I was traveling in Vietnam. Fresh turmeric root isn't widely used in traditional Indian cooking, but it's a staple in Southeast Asian cuisine. So we're starting with fresh turmeric root, and this basically looks like ginger, but once you cut it down the middle, you will see it is very different. I think it looks really pretty, thinly sliced, so I'm just going to make some thin slices and rings. Are there any benefits to using fresh overground? So, you know, it's not a simple, um, this is better than that. I would say in a perfect world, you should incorporate both. Turmeric powder is rich in vitamin C and B6, plus it contains magnesium and iron. From a culinary perspective, they're very unique. The fresh um, has this sort of more vibrant, zesty kind of vibe, whereas the dry is definitely earthier, a little bit more bitter, and really amenable to adding to things like curries, soups, vegetables, whereas this is really nice in teas, broths, soups, and smoothies. Okay, so what are we adding in next? Okay, so next up we're going in with ginger. So next up is lemongrass, which I think just adds a really beautiful flavor and almost like a grassy note. Are we boiling this to the max? I like to boil the water, turn it off, and then add the turmeric and let it steep. And that's because I'm trying to preserve some of those essential oils that are really, really rich in the fresh turmeric. The turmeric tea needs about five minutes to steep. Our tea is hanging out, it's steeping, it's having a good time. I have so many questions for you about all things turmeric. So let's talk through all of these different varieties. There's actually so many. So here we have the Roma turmeric, which you can see is really, really vibrant orange. It's the one we used in our tea. Next, the yellow and mango varieties of turmeric both have a lighter color and a more delicate flavor. This is crazy, I've never seen this before. And it's a slightly different turmeric varietal. There's a lot of chefs, especially here in New York, that absolutely love blue turmeric because of this pine menthol flavor. Does it add color though? So I think um, it's very subtle, the color. Yeah. It's not as much, obviously, as the other ones. Whole dried turmeric root can be grated into dishes. It adds a unique brightness compared to the powdered spice. What are your tips for buying turmeric from the store? So my first tip is to buy it from a reputable spice brand and not from an open spice market. I love open spice markets, but we do have some disturbing evidence now that sometimes turmeric can be laced with heavy metals, specifically lead chromate to make it look more vibrant. Buy it where there is a clear package date and an expiration date so that you can at least know when it was packaged. So what about fresh turmeric? How do we store that? I would treat it just like you would ginger. So you would buy your fresh turmeric, put it in your fridge, maybe for like a week to 10 days. And if you want to store it longer, I would put it in the freezer. It's actually very easy to grate. A common cooking technique in Indian cuisine is blooming turmeric in hot oil and pairing it with black pepper. This helps bring out the flavor of both spices. So talk to me about the relationship between black pepper and curcumin. And is that a myth? Totally should be doing that. So curcumin, which is the main bioactive in turmeric, is obviously packed with benefits, but unfortunately isn't very well absorbed by the body. It's rapidly cleared by the liver. You really want to improve that bioavailability, as we call it, and you can do that by pairing it with black pepper. And that's because black pepper has a compound called piperin, which can reduce that clearance of the curcumin by the liver. In Western medicine, there have been few studies 
with limited participants, conducted about the interaction between ground turmeric and black pepper, but Conchin says the research looks promising. I've learned so much, and now I'm very excited to drink some tea. Is it ready? It's ready. It's been steeping for a good five to eight minutes, Yay. so we're ready to pour. Let's drink it. So this is almost ready to drink, and the okay. reason I say almost is because of the pepper point that we just covered. So if you really want to bring out those health benefits, especially from the turmeric, just a little dash of black pepper is Ooh. all you need. And finally, we want to add a little drop of a healthy fat, and that's because Pepper will improve the bioavailability of the curcumin, but so will a fat source. And I'm just going in with a very tiny drizzle of olive oil. Ooh. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Okay. Isn't it lovely? It's so vibrant and like zesty. It's but vibrant. But also not overwhelming at all. Right. I love learning how to make this. So thank you. Say turmeric. Turmeric. <laughs> I'm gonna show you how to use turmeric in one of my favorite ways, kichudi. Kichudi goes by many names in India, from kichuri to kichuri to kejuri. Every region in the country has a unique version, but it's usually made with lentils, rice, and turmeric. And like any popular comfort food, every family has their own spin on the dish. My mom didn't really make a stew, but her combo of light and fluffy rice with lentils was always one of my favorite meals. Something that's really important to know when you're cooking lentils and rice is that it's really important to rinse and soak them before cooking. Rinsing helps get rid of any debris in the rice or the lentils, and then soaking them will allow it to cook faster. And now I'm just gonna drain the water before I start cooking. I'm just gonna add enough water to completely cover the rice and lentils so that we can cook it properly. This is roughly four to five cups of water, but I just want you to make sure that you're covering the rice and lentils completely. Now we're gonna add turmeric, our star. We can't have kitchen without it. It's gonna add that nice golden color and it's delicious. So I'm gonna cook the lentils and the rice until it's completely mushy. I want it to be really soft. The lentils cook for 30 to 35 minutes. While this is coming to a boil, I'm gonna start prepping my veggies. The best part about kitchen is that you can really sub in your favorite veggies. I'm using carrots, zucchini, and sweet potatoes, but green beans are also really nice here. You know, I really like to be a vegetable artiste. Uh, but you can cut your veggies however you want. My lentils and rice, they've come to a boil. I'm gonna move it to my back burner on a simmer, and then I'm gonna bring my steaming basket over here so I can start steaming my veggies. I let the veggies steam for about 10 minutes until fork tender. Time to chop up my aromatics. First, a rough dice for my onion. Then, just peel and grate fragrant ginger. My veggies are done, I'm gonna move them to my stove top and then get to work on sauteing my aromatics. Now that my pan is hot, I'm gonna go ahead and add my coconut oil. Once the oil starts to shimmer, I'm gonna go ahead and add my cumin seeds. I'm adding whole cumin seeds to the oil to allow the cumin seeds to bloom, extract that delicious flavor. 
but you know it's ready when the cumin seed starts to sizzle and bubble. You only want this to go for about 15 to 30 seconds. You don't want the oil to burn. Then you're gonna go ahead and add your onions. That's the sound we like. We're cooking these onions on medium heat until they're tender and translucent about three to four minutes. Okay, and now I'm gonna go ahead and add my grated ginger. I'm gonna cook this for a couple minutes with the ginger. We're gonna add some salt and pepper. I gotta clean my workstation so we can assemble our kitcheny and take this off the heat. Check out the rice and lentils. <gasps> now is the time where everyone becomes friends. White shirt, risky. <laughs> I'm gonna turn my stove on, cook the lentils and rice with the onions for about two to three minutes, and then I'll go ahead and add my veggies, cook everything together, and then we'll be done. I'm ready to serve myself a bowl of kitchen. I've been waiting for this moment for a very long time. I finished my kitchen with some fresh cilantro and freshly ground black pepper. Take a quick picture, send it to my mom who I hope will be very proud of me. I think I got the shot. Now I get to eat. The best part, obviously. Oh, so good. Cheers. It's so good. It's very nostalgic for me too. What else can I say? It's cute, it's comforting, it's kitschy. That should go on a shirt. I have a bit of a kitchen lunch date. I'm going to be joined by nutritionist Sarika Shah, who's going to talk to me about all things turmeric and kitchen. Get away! Sarika, it's so nice to meet you. I have been very excited about our kitchen date. I just made some. Um, can you talk to me first about your family's kitchen recipe? Because I know, you know, depending on where you're from in India, everyone makes it a little bit different. I use my mom's recipe. Um, it's a one-to-one -one dal and basmati rice ratio. But something slightly different my mom does is add um, spinach to it. Sarika Shah, AKA the Indian nutritionist on Instagram, is a registered dietitian. She's been practicing for more than 20 years. Her goal is to teach Indian Americans how to eat traditional dishes in a healthier way. She also happens to know a lot about turmeric. What are the nutritional benefits of turmeric that have maybe actually been backed up by science? Are there any? So um, science is still studying turmeric, but turmeric claims to treat skin disorders, upper respiratory infections, any ache and pain essentially. Um, and that comes from Ayurvedic medicine. So does science back it up? There's limited studies, subjects of 40 to about 120, but I have seen studies with a thousand, but that's really not enough to give me the science backing to say, yes, this is exactly what it proves and this is what it does. But the studies are positive, so I think there should be more studies done. So with that being said, do you include turmeric as an element of your recommendations for clients at all? Um, no. Turmeric as a capsule or curcumin, which is the compound out of turmeric that is also glorified. So I don't recommend that. I'm very cautious about that because FDA regulations are not stringent on supplements. Is it laced with lead? Is it have other products in it? So um, if you want to include turmeric, the only way I will ever tell people is included in your food in the powder form. So tell me about how you feel about Indian food and turmeric as well coming to the forefront of food and culture. Especially in the U.S. that Indian food is coming up to the forefront, that it's being appreciated as healthier food, um, as something good. And I think that's great for the generations growing up. When I grew up, I would never bring Indian food to lunch. I wouldn't be caught dead with that um, <laughs> because the smell or the color or people staring at me, but if it's now something that they claim as like a lentil soup, which is actually our dal with rice, no one's gonna bat eyelashes at it. I think it's when we glamorize it and we try to make large doses of it and make it something bigger than it really is, is where the risk comes in. But if we take it for as it is and the way we've used it for thousands of years in our culture, I think it's perfect and it's great. Turmeric is definitely the golden child of spices. Its warming aroma and Ayurvedic properties have been staples in India for centuries. As more research is conducted on its health benefits, there's no doubt that this spice's popularity will continue to rise. 
but turmeric's cultural significance should never be ignored. Do you see this? See this pizza? You wanna eat this pizza? Too bad, I'm going to. <laughs> I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. Who doesn't just love ooey, gooey, and totally decadent cheese? I know you do. Americans truly can't get enough. In fact, we've tripled our cheese consumption since the 70s. Today, the average person here eats a whopping 35 pounds of cheese a year. 35! So it's no surprise that cheese is usually one of the toughest things to give up if you're ditching dairy. But I've got some good news for you. These days,